right, good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning. I hope that you um, are getting comfortable. I've got some coffee. Uh, we have an amazing group of people here today, so I'm just, I'm really thrilled to see all of you. Um, so welcome, I'm Lisa Guernsey. I'm the director of the Teaching, Learning, and Tech program at New America. We're part of the Education Policy Program. And I'm also the senior advisor for our early and elementary education policy program here. So many of you may know me from my, my years of working in the early childhood space, and it's an exciting moment for me to be able to be working on this pre-conference with all of you because it's bringing together the, the tech work that I've been doing over all of these years along with all of the early childhood pieces. So it's incredibly exciting. Um, many of you may be here at New America for the very first time, um, and I just want to say a big welcome to you. For those of you who don't know, we are a think tank that's dedicated to renewing, renewing America. Um, that's where that new America comes from, by confronting and, and continuing the quest to realize our nation's highest ideals, honestly confronting the challenges that we're facing today, both with technological change and social change, and seeing opportunities to really create um, a better world for all of um, our people in, in our country and beyond. We're now celebrating our 20th year, which is pretty exciting. So a few notes, oh thank you. I know, and I've been here for 10 of those 20, so I'm starting to feel like a real old timer. Um, so a few notes for you. So those of you who are here in the room with us, um, you're welcome to get on our Wi-Fi network. It's New America Guest, and that's our password up there. Um, for, we do have several people who are listening in and watching online this morning, so welcome to all of you. And for those um, who are online or those who here in the room have the ability to multitask like this, which I think is very difficult, feel free to be um, at tweeting uh, as you'd like. We have these two hashtags that we're using um, the, Namely, the Namely 19 is going to be used throughout the next three days as part of the National Association for Media Literacy Education Conference. And Media Mentors has been used for a lot of the issues that we're talking about today. So um, I want to, I'll give you a couple more remarks to kind of get us all um, ready and warmed up. But I first, I'm going to turn over the podium for a moment to Michelle Shula Lipkin, who is the Executive Director for the National Association for Media Literacy Education. She's also an amazing friend and colleague on so many of these issues. And we're, yes, come Sorry. on up, Michelle. <laughs> and we're so excited <laughs> to be working with you, Michelle. So I'm going to turn you. it over okay. to you, and then we'll, and I'll come back up after that. Awesome. So, thank you. Great. I'm going to be brief. I know that's, for people who know me, it's shocking. But um, <laughs> thank you guys so much for being here. This is like the most exciting thing, because today launches what I can tell you is the most ambitious three days of Namely's entire 20 plus year history. Um, huge thank you to Lisa. I adore her as a woman, as a friend, as a mother, and her leadership in this space is just totally inspiring. So thank you so much for doing this and having us here. So for those of you who, uh, who don't know, Namely is a nonprofit membership organization dedicated to expanding the practice of media literacy education around the US. So we are here in DC this week for our biennial national conference. Um, this year's theme is a path forward, elevating conversation, unify unifying voices. So today we have actually four pre-conference sessions going on around the city. Uh, tonight we have a kickoff event at the Peace Tech Lab. Tomorrow we are at American University all day and on Friday we're at the museum. We have 170 presenters throughout the couple of days. We have 300 people coming we're really excited about um, what we're going to talk about and uh, who we're going to meet over the next few days. So this is the third biennial conference in a row where we've done an early education pre-con. So I need to acknowledge Faith Rogo over there who is <laughs> She's Namely's founding president. She's also one of my media literacy heroes. Um, and her commitment to media literacy in general, but also 
er, specifically early childhood has sparked really kind of a movement that will continue in this room today. So thank you, Faith, for everything. Um, I'm really proud that Namely is a part of the group that's been prioritizing media literacy for our youngest learners. There's no doubt, obviously, that we have reached a point in our digital world where there should be no minimum age um, when we start to have these discussions. Um, it's an absolute imperative to ensure that our youngest citizens receive a strong foundation to kind of proceed through life successfully. Um, I can't wait to hear about the stuff that you guys discussed today. The worst part of my job is I don't get to stay at any one of these <laughs> because I'm going to be visiting each one, so I'm sorry to not be here. I just want to quickly recognize uh, David Kleeman right here. He is namely board member. Um, he will be here all day. I also, besides Faith, Sherry Hope Culver is a past board member of Namely. Um, Rachel Artiega right there is on the Leadership Council. So if you have questions about Namely, they are the people to go to. Um, quick thing, I am leaving kickoff event information. I am leaving save the dates for Media Literacy Week 2019. It's happening October 21st to 25th. And for those of you who are not members of Namely, it is free. So go to namely.net and sign up today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thanks. Excellent. So um, now that we've all um, had our coffee and we're getting woken up this morning, um, we're going to do just a very quick a couple little exercises to make sure we see everybody in the room and know who's here. We have an incredible array of, of people here today crossing many different sectors and, and boundaries. So. Um, I'm going to ask you to just quickly stand up um, to just so people can see um, who's here. So stand up if you are a teacher or if you work in a classroom or an early learning center with young children. If any, any kind of classroom. Excellent. So our educators who are here. Thank you very much for being here. Stand up if you're someone who works in a library or in a museum or works in the museum or library world in some way. Excellent. <laughs> Welcome. So stand up if you are, and you may have double, you may, you know, you may have lots of dual identities here. Stand up if you're a researcher or a university faculty member or someone who's kind of doing that analysis. A lot of you, excellent. How about those who might be a policy analyst or work for a policy-oriented organization here in Washington, D.C.? All right, that's my colleague Abby and Sabia. Um, content developers, media makers. How many of those do we have in the room? A few of you are here. Wonderful. Thank you for being here. And lastly, if you're someone who writes for a blog um, or does videos or just produces um, media for your organization. Um, anybody? Many of you? Yes, welcome. Great. Thank you so much. So the purpose of our time together is really to elevate the dialogue on why young children need media literacy education. We're going to zoom in on questions of equity and help educators and influencers of all kinds see what this can look like in practice done in very high quality ways. So we have more than 60 education and media literacy leaders with us. We have folks from all different time zones, including, um, and I don't know if Denise is here yet, oh yes she is, including from Melbourne, Australia. So hooray for Denise. You'll hear from her in a moment. Um, we're going to start with a very um, classic kind of media literacy exercise, and then we're going to get straight to our panel. Um, but one of the questions, of course, you, you ask when you think about setting something like this up is um, how do we want to ref why do we want to frame today's remarks? How do we want to frame the conversation, right? And so when it comes to thinking about children and media, and these days most people do think of digital media, but today's conversation is going to have print as well. We're going to be doing hybrid print and digital. But when we think about children and media, often the question is, how much time should children be spending with this technology and these tools and this media? Um, and can we limit it? And that's often where the questions go. And those, I totally get it. I'm a parent. I, I understand where those questions come from. But that really is a pretty tight narrow frame. So what if we zoomed out just a little bit? So that clock is still there in this photograph, but there is a lot more going on for children than just what time it is on the wall. So we see that children are learning in the context of each other, in the context of a particular learning setting. They're being exposed to or surrounded by particular types of content. 
there are a lot of important questions that we can now be asking about what are they learning and how are they learning it. That clock is still on the wall and nobody is saying we should take the clock off the wall. But we do have a lot more work to do and a lot more questions to ponder in terms of what is best for young children, what is available to our young children and what is not available to them and which children are gaining which kinds of experiences. So here at New America, we've been watching with interest a lot of projects across the country. And just last month, I had the great opportunity to go to Pittsburgh to visit during their Remake Learning Days. So those of you, I think there's a couple of you from Pittsburgh here. Um, Remake Learning Days is now national, but Pittsburgh birthed it as an idea. And it's a festival of learning across the city. Um, it's an amazing way to see the richness of opportunity. And I wanted to note that because the Grable Foundation, which has supported that, put out a report recently. And I'm going to quote from that report. Um, in that report, it's talking about kind of our, our next generation, our children today who will be our workers of the future. And they say, tomorrow's most successful workers will be the people you can go to with problems, who can listen, ask questions, and think through complex issues who can lead diverse, collaborative teams. They will be endlessly curious and radically empathetic. And most importantly, they'll be lifelong learners. Endlessly curious and radically empathetic. I love that line. And I was like, OK, I got to write that. I got to put that in this. I got to borrow it and steal it and say it over and over again. Because um, today, I hope it will be doing exactly that. Um, we'll have literacy squarely in mind. We're going to be valuing inquiry. We're going to be valuing questions. On your tables, you see there's little uh, question bubbles right in there, whatever you want, whatever questions are on your mind. There's yellow stickies. If something is coming up for you that you want to make sure you write down, write it down. You can put it up on our burning questions page. You can hold it for our Q&As later. Um, you can put it up in Twitter. Um, but please, we, we invite lots of questions. And so. In the spirit of questions, we're now going to go to our panel. So I, oh, sorry, we're not going to go to our panel quite yet. Sorry. There's one more fun activity for us. We're going to go to menti.com to do a quick question uh, exercise. Um, so um, if you have a smartphone with you or a laptop open, if you can quickly just go www.menti.com and put in this code, and we're going to switch the screen now, the folks in the back who are helping me. And you'll still be able to see the code up there so that you can get in. But if you go to menti.com, hopefully it'll show up here in a moment. What I want you to do is just think about a question that's on your mind that you came in here with today. Um, and this might be a question. I want to start with what questions. Just something that's on your mind, something like, what am I going to have for breakfast is a what question. Hopefully, it might be something about the topic at hand. Um, I'm sorry. So there we go. Yes. So go to menti.com and use the code 71279 and type in a what question that's on your mind this morning. Um, that was my little test, what is for breakfast. But hopefully we'll start seeing some of you put in some questions in there, and you, we can kind of get a sense of what people might be thinking. And after we do this what question, we will do a why question as well. And then we're going to get to our panel real quick. So has anybody had any luck hitting send or putting a question in yet? Hoping this works. Um, Aha, uh -huh. what would help the next generation deal with disinformation? What can I do to support media literacy with children and caregivers in my library? What can make this work more inclusive? What can we really accomplish in the next 12 months? What can we provide to parents that can frame their media mentoring for children? This is good. This is working. I'm very excited. And it's fun to see these questions come up. What can we do to encourage computer usage for things other than Roblox or violence? Interesting. What are the imperatives for media literacy education? How do we define screen time and what is best for children under age five? So OK, this is exciting. And we're going to be collecting all of this and saving it. Um, so we'll be able to get back to some of this as well. Now let's go to the why question on the next page. It's the same exact code, but you'll see, and maybe on your screen it'll say, you know, now we're, we've transferred to a next question, um, which is the why question. And you can start putting your whys in there. Do things I'm like, why? There we go. Why? A oh, why? Um, any, any questions you may want to ask? And, and this is a way of, for those of you guys who do yoga, of like setting your intentions for the day, right? Like these are the questions that we're going to try to grapple with here. And we'll see if by the end of the day we've been, made any progress on them. So hopefully a few of those will come up because we're running a little late and want to get to our panel. But um, 
We'll give it a minute more and see if any questions might pop up for people. I've got two or three folks in there maybe. Why should we be focusing on media literacy before kids can read? I think that's a really fair question. We should be adding into the mix. There may be some more that come up. Um, so while we're waiting for a couple more of these, I will, I'm just going to pause and say we're working on the air conditioning. We've got one of these DC days of 100, almost 100 degrees or whatever in terms of what the feel like temperatures outside. So sorry that's getting a little warm in here, but we're going to get the AC going um, stronger. So why don't more people know about media literacy? Why do we view media literacies in a different light from traditional literacies? Interesting. Why do kids feel so quickly connected to Alexa, to digital assistants? It's fascinating. Why is the work of early childhood educators so undervalued? Why do we limit time rather than ensure the quality? Excellent. Okay, so yay. I'm very glad to see that your brains are also um, very kind of tuned into this uh, topic this morning. So now um, I will. We'll go to the panel. Let me um, invite our panelists to come up this morning. We're gonna, I'm going to pose a couple of quick questions for them, but mostly it'll be about them having a conversation and providing some um, grounding information for us. We have Faith Rogo, who you heard earlier, who is uh, um, the founding president for Insiders Education, as well as the founding president of Namely. We have um, Jamie Naidu. Come on up, you guys. We'll sit in our, come sit here. And I'll, I'll be on the very end over there, so you can grab the chair, I think, that you're signed here. And Vivian Vasquez from American University, who is the author of Navigating Critical Literacies for Young Children. If you haven't seen um, Vivian's writing on this topic, I highly recommend it. All right, and I'm going to sit over there and just ask a couple of questions to get us started. Okay, great. And Vivian here is it? at that point. Yes. All right, so let's get us. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me okay now? We're all good? Okay. Um, we're going to move forward. We're. Um, I, I really just want to stress how fortunate we are to have all of these three amazing people up here today for this conversation. Um, one, we had the, just had the American Library Association annual meeting, so that means that anybody here who's been in the world of libraries, like Jamie, who's been in a million meetings and um, doing a bunch of amazing sessions over the past weekend, is probably a little exhausted already. Um, but Jamie, we're so glad to have you with us. And then for Vivian and Faith, with the Media Literacy Conference just about to kick off, there's a lot of work that you've been involved in. So we're at the intersection point, with, which I think is a really nice place to be. So Faith, I'm going to start with you. Um, and not only um, are you the founding president for Namely, but your work has been so incredibly um, helpful in guiding the field and guiding educators as well as people who work on professional development for young children. And one of the things that I've learned from you is that framing concept, right? Um, and, and yet we do have questions of what can young children, does this make sense for it to be teaching these kinds of concepts to young children? So can you start us off by telling us a little bit about why things like framing, for example, might be something you can, in fact, teach young children? Okay, so the framing, of course, in an educational context is important because it determines what we end up doing, right? So, but the, the concept is borrowed from a media production thing, right? We, we make frame, you take a camera, every time you take a camera, you're making a frame around something. Every time you create a painting or a picture, you're putting a frame around something. And of course, from media production, we know that the frame can really change your under, a viewer's understanding of what the media messages are. So for example, imagine you know, a king in some ancient castle, right, Game of Thrones, no. Um, <laughs> And, and he has a court artist, a court painter. And that painter is going to paint him in all his grandeur sitting on his throne, right? An opposition painter might zoom out that frame and show people protesting outside the castle, right? So we, we know that just changing the frame can change things a lot. That's an exercise that's really easy to do with young children. Even, I think, maybe helping them understand when they're struggling with ideas of permanence and not permanence, that young, right? Because they can take their fingers and go like this and move around. I could ask you to do this now or do it with your phones or, or tablets if you have them, 
And I could ask you to frame this room in a way that would make it look like this uh, pre-conference was just packed with enthusiastic <laughs> people, or the opposite, that man, people are really, you know, they're, it was kind of eh, not so fun and kind of empty and what, really easy to do by what we choose to put in that frame or, or not frame. And so we take that and I think we transfer it to thinking about how the way we frame our questions, what we see as the purpose of media literacy, um, and what we do, because of course, you know, you can do a media literacy activity. You can analyze an ad for the purpose of making the people who are doing the analysis better advertisers. Or you can analyze an ad for the purpose of helping people develop a critical lens towards advertising, right? So our framing, what our purpose is, what our goals are going into it makes a difference. Um, but I also want to say it also makes a difference in terms of who, who, what parts of ourselves we bring to this task. And that's about our relationship with the kids that we're working with. Not just mm -hmm. the intellectual part of what we're doing or the activity or lesson part or discussion part of what we're doing. But you know, the, the dominant paradigm for a long time in early childhood was a medical one. People pathologized media use, especially screen time. And then it was all about taking what is essentially a public health approach, right? I have a very specific outcome, and there's no varying from that outcome, right? If we want people to not smoke because smoking isn't good for them, it's not OK to be fuzzy around, well, I'll smoke a little bit, or that's the message we'll send, right? You have to send the message, and the behavior you want is no smoking, right? Um, in a public health paradigm, for media use, the, the answer has become kind of to demonize screen time. Uh, and I, there we could talk for hours about why I think that is a head in the sand approach to the real world we actually live in right now. Um, but, but I think it's a mistake because it leads to us, the, the part of ourselves that we bring to that conversation is our worried and concerned and anxiety-filled self. Mm -hmm. Now imagine that that's determining our relationship with our children. Instead of bringing an educational frame that's a literacy frame that's about rich conversation and exploration that brings our creative frame, our imagination, our enthusiasm, our, you know, all of those kinds of parts of ourselves. So I mean, I think I'll stop my answer there. But, but uh, mm -hmm. this framing thing makes a huge, huge difference in the work that we're talking about here. And I always love just the way you think about that, even with, say, four or five-year-old kids, right? That really does help to kind of bring it down to, like, these, you, can, you can get this kind of started early in terms of the way children are thinking. So Vivian, I'll turn to you. And um, I had mentioned your, your book a, a moment ago. In, in that book and, and in others, um, there's one that's focused on technology and young children. You paint some pictures for us of what um, it can look like in a classroom to use some of these kind of methods um, with uh, young children. And you're also coming to it um, from kind of imagining a different discourse around the materials that children might be using in the classroom. So um, tell me a little bit about that and, and also how this can connect to this question of equity and ensuring that every child is feeling kind of that they're a part of the conversation. OK, so I mean, what Faith was saying with regards to framing is just really important in my work as well. So I, what I think I want to do is just share a story um, that took place in the, in the classroom, so it's sort of a language story literacy lesson type thing, whereby, the, so this is a, a JKSK classroom in Canada, so the kids are between the ages of three to five. And the classroom teacher basically framed his teaching from a critical literacy perspective. So his, he attempted to create as much space as possible for engaging with critical literacy. It's more as a way of being rather than as a topic for study. So what he did to begin with was, and maybe I'll use these just so that people yeah, can yeah, see. Yeah, and so, yeah, yeah, the other way. This one on the right-hand side. OK. So he starts, he starts a lot of the work that he does with these children using picture books. So he started with this particular picture book, Monday Frudel. 
And um, so he read the book with the kids. So if you don't know the story, it's about these birds who basically end up choosing to make different sounds other than peep or, you know, and tweet, except for the crow. The crow kind of resists this until the very end of the book when suddenly the crow decides that, you know, it too will, will use a different sound. So all of the reviews of this book that, that you know, the kids read and that, that I had seen focus more on reading with the text. So when we read with the text, what we're basically doing is we're, we're sort of getting at the more dominant messages in the text, the ones that more widely circulate. So reading with the text is something that Brian did with his students all the time. And then the other side of that was reading against the text. And when we read against the text, we work to resist or disrupt those dominant um, readings of, of text. And it doesn't matter whether it's a book or a movie or a song or a print ad, whatever it is. So what was really interesting about what happened was with Brian's students, be because he'd been framing his work from this critical literacy perspective, when they read the, the book Frudel, their take on it was very different than the reviewers. So they were already really good at reading with the text. But what was really significant was the way that they read against the text. So their notion, whereas you know the reviewers were saying, it's really good to be different, was, was the basic message. What the kids were saying is, it's really good to be different, yes. But then they felt that the crow was being pressured to be different. So the question for them was, who gets to decide? And when, do you, when, when does that happen? All right, so let me just. So this is Cushy. Cushy's four years old. This drawing is her response to the book Frudel, the reading of the book Frudel. So the, the image on the right, that's her mom. Cushy's mom um, was trying to convince Cushy to cook Indian food to bring to school. And so that's Cushy's mom on the right. On the left is Cushy. And so that's Cushy really not wanting to bring this Indian food to school. The circle in the middle is the, is the food <laughs> that sort of served as a wedge between Cushy's mom and herself, and really a wedge between Cushy's life, cultural sort of life at home, and then her life at school. So she was really hesitant. So she was, she was sort of in this, in this space of in-betweenness, feeling like you know, she was carrying with her these multiple identities and really struggling with um, sorting out those identities. So she loves her mom. She loves her culture. But she's worried about bringing that culture into school for fear that you know, she wouldn't be, the kids wouldn't accept this, this Indian food that she was bringing. And so that came through in her drawing. So then Brian decided, I mean, one of the things that he does with kids, he brings in lots of, you know, print ads and media messages and so forth, and the kids work with those texts. Um, they deconstruct them, they reconstruct them, so forth and so on. And one of the things that he wanted them to do, because they had, you know, been really interested in this Toys R Us um, print ad flyer, so he had them sort of think, they read the ad, they talked about, you know, the different images and the words that were included in the ad. They talked about, you know, what are some words and images that you think, you know, should have been included that were, that you feel were left out, was sort of missing. So those are the kinds of conversations they had around the ad. And then he said to them, so we, we sort of took, because I've been working with Brian for a while, we took this idea of Jasper Johns, you know, so, so you take an object, and then you do something to it, and then you do something else to it, and then you do something else to it. Um, so they started out with the flyer, and then they were going to do something to it. Um, and doing something to it was they were going to create their own version of the flyer. And so, you know, they went online, and they found all kinds of different ads and images and so forth and so on, and printed them out, cut them up. And then, you know, started to create their own version of this Toys R Us flyer. They then, then did something else to it. And in doing something else to the flyer, they went back and reread their own constructions. 
So there's a lot of like meta work going on. These are like three to five year olds, right? So there's a lot of meta work going on. They go back and they're, they're, they're deconstructing their own text. And they're, they're now, you know, critiquing their own text. And so this time, they, you know, they, he asked them to think about who and what was missing from the text, basically, was, was what they needed to do. So they went ahead and they did that. And so that, those were cushies. I guess I forgot to mention that. Those were Cushy's um, flyers. So this was her final piece of her flyer. Um, so here, what Brian did was he had them find words, phrases, sentences to add to their catalog to make a statement about um, you know, what they wanted the catalog to be about. Because um, you know, they, had, they had talked about how different print ads and so forth and, and so on sort of put on offer this way of thinking, way of being, way of acting that we take in, that we interpret, and it becomes sort of something that, that starts to shape who we are and what we can do, what, what we want to do, what we can be, what we want to be. So what's interesting about this is that if you look at the three circles, the three areas that are circled, so these were Cushy's final additions to her flyer when she said, okay, this is, this is sort of it for now. And if you were able, I don't know, you can see that very closely, but the three images are images of women in saris and in more traditional Indian dress. So what was really powerful about seeing this is that when Brian had worked with, you know, the, the print-based text and engaged in those conversations, Cushy was really, you know, in that in-between space. It was very uncomfortable in um, bringing her own culture into the classroom. And then after they worked through these different media images, and it sort of helped her to understand, wait a minute, you know, I'm not in this text. I don't see myself in this text. And that drove her to include herself in the text. And so working with, with you know, the, the media images really helped her to reposition herself in that classroom. So that no longer was, was her culture, her home, home culture, a wedge. It now became you know, who she was and who she could be in that classroom. Thank you, thank you, Vivian. Yeah, so I, I'm going to toss it over to, to Jamie now for a moment, that yet getting to these questions of I identity, but with younger children. How, how do we think about that? How do we do that um, in a developmentally appropriate way? I'm sure that's on a lot of your minds right now. Jamie um, may do. I didn't um, fully introduce you earlier, Jamie, so everyone should. Um, Jamie um, has been just an incredible friend to the world of, of media mentorship. Um, he is the um, president of the Association for Library Service to Children. I guess outgoing president at this time, so your duties are almost over. Um, and, a, and a professor at the University of Alabama in the in library uh, school, and School of Information Studies. So Jamie, I wanted you to um, to help us understand this, both from your perspective and your background, which is, I think, very interesting in this, in this context as well, um, but also to help us understand what role does an informal learning setting like a library mm -hmm. play in this conversation? All right, awesome. So just first of all, just picking, uh, yeah, I'll take the clicker. Uh, picking up on just what you were just saying about the images and how the, the, the child went through and she circled all her, all her images of what she would like to have seen in that catalog. Um, that is what librarians are all about. We're, as media mentors, I mean, we've always been media mentors. We've always been connecting the right book with the right child at the right time. Now we're kind of expanding into, okay, in addition to books, what else can we do? And so now when, under media mentorship, a lot of times people think of as, as being digital apps and things like that. But part of that is, all, is making sure children see representations of themselves. And they have, as Radine Sims Bishop, I don't, I'm sure you know her from Everybody knows, quotes her as the mirrors and windows in children's books and how it's important to see representations of yourself, so the mirror or window into other cultures. And so that's what librarians are all about, is providing those opportunities. And you're talking about the critical, having critical literacy and critical conversations. Is, it's also, you can provide those books, but then you can also read a book and share and say, okay, now who's not being represented? Who's missing from here? Um, and I think, you know, talking about like how I kind of got into this, uh, so I grew up in very rural Kentucky, in the middle of nowhere. We, you know, grew up in a trailer in a high poverty area. There was not a public library. Uh, there was a bookmobile that came. 
And so the bookmobile was the really the, I had access to that and then whatever my mother picked up books at the yard sale. So I didn't understand really public libraries until I was actually a professor. Um, I understood what public libraries were all about and the, the role of public libraries. But I did see what school libraries could do because I had a very strong school librarian. And, and that helped to shape me of what I wanted to do. I originally thought, oh, I want to be a school librarian, which I was at some point. But then once I learned more about public libraries, I'm like, oh, I want to be a public librarian, which I was at one point. Um, so because in those, all those settings, I saw an opportunity to provide reflections of kids' lives that they didn't see. Growing up as a kid, I saw reflections of me as a white person. But I did not see very many stories that showed images of me as a boy who didn't quite fit what gender you know, stereotypes believe what a boy should do, or a boy that wanted to play with dolls, or a boy that you know, just wanted to be more caring and nurturing. That wasn't available. Um, and as a school librarian, I had worked with a large Latino population. And there was a huge divide between um, what the children were seeing in their classroom and what I made available in the library. I had books with Latino culture represented, the Latinx culture represented, but the teachers didn't have them in their library or in their classrooms, and they weren't using them. And so it was an interesting conversation that I had, even with the ESL teacher who came in one day, and she was like, oh my gosh, one of my students is really like, for the first time, he's on fire now because he found Chateau and the party animals. And he's like really connecting with the culture here. I'm like, yeah. I mean, like, that's the whole point. Um, so I think the whole point of us as media mentors is really connecting with educators, connecting with parents, um, and helping them discern, find good media that's going to help kids uh, see themselves or talk about other cultures. So here, um, I just talked about, you know, what librarians, what do we do? First of all, we have a media mentorship white paper, which is in your handbook or in your little folder that talks a little bit about what we see as media mentorship throughout. We also have a book that was uh, created uh, by some of the people um, here in this room or that will be in the room later. Um, but then there's also, you know, in addition to helping connect, we also help find high quality. We curate lists of good digital apps. And I'm always telling um, librarians and educators and, and maybe my students when I talk to them that books have a little bit more of a vetting process in terms of getting into the hands of kids. You know, Unless you self-publish a book and then for some reason it becomes a hot seller, most people are not going to see it. If it wins in an award or you know, uh, it goes through a regular publishing process, it's on the shelf anybody can access that. It's a little bit different with a piece over the digital media. Any one of us in this room can create something. Any one of us can throw it, throw it up into, you know, online, you know, apps, when, when the app stores. Anybody can purchase that and have their kids have access to that. But we don't know the quality of that. We don't know what cultures are being represented and, and whether those are good or positive representations. And so the role of the librarian is to connect not just print media, but also digital media, and making sure that we have those positive representations available. And so that's, that's what we're always talking about, just having those positive access to that. And then we also model how to use that. So the libraries also are closing that digital divide, providing access. Um, and we were talking about this a little bit this past weekend um, in one of our meetings about how the library is kind of like the living room for the community, the public library, the living room for the community. And some kids are in a media tech saturated environment. So their families don't want them having access to technology. So that's fine. We have those opportunities. But then there's the kids that do not live in a media rich environment or, do not, or a print technology rich, sorry, technology rich environment. So it's important for them to have access to the technology either through wireless devices or through, through mobile devices or whatever we, you know, the library can provide, but then also the parents have opportunities to learn how to use that with the kids. And so we can do modeling. Librarians are dropping in early literacy tips as they're doing their story times. Well, they can also drop in tips on how to properly use media with, with kids, co-viewing, co-sharing, you know, and, and then model that. And so here I just showed the Mother Goose on the Loose uh, Feltboard app, which is cre created by um, Betsy Demon Cohen in, a long, in addition with Feltboard Smoothie. And that's just a way uh, Mother Goose on the Loose is a whole early childhood literacy uh, program. And so she had created that to kind of as a way to introduce that. And some libraries are embracing this wonderfully, and other ones, they're getting there. Yeah. Thank you. And I know that we're going to be uh, we're running, we're running short on time. Let me do this. Um, I wanted to ask each of you if you could respond to a um, question about kind of the time that we're living in right now and the, the worries of digital disinformation that's out there, um, putting quote marks around the word fake news <laughs> as I'm saying it, but how we can make sure that the next generation is equipped to be able to kind of withstand these, these forces. And um, I think that helps to position maybe everything that we're, we're doing as well. But, do you have some reflections on 
what we in the room should be thinking about when it comes to dealing with the influx of information out there that's trying to kind of shape a different reality than maybe what reality is. Um, and of course, that is a loaded question in itself. Faith, did you want to sure. jump in on that I'll, one? I'll take a quick shot. Um, I think the, the way we're going to grapple with this is to envision, so what are the skills that kids actually need? So if, if, if think about you know, what you envision doing with them now and, and what you want them to be able to do 20 years from now. right? And some of that's a little hard because we're not sure what the technologies are going to look like 20 years from now. But some of it is not so hard because so much of what we want them to do is really not about the technologies. It, so beyond you know, teaching somebody how to spot a URL and whether it's fake or not, you know, that, that kind of stuff. So what are the deeper skills that people need to grapple with this digital world where we all have almost the entire world of information literally in the palm of our hands, right? What, what kinds of things do you need to navigate that without going, you know, just bonkers? Um, let alone to be able to do it effectively and get the information you want and communicate what you want to communicate and be able to share and collaborate and all of that kind of thing. And so for early childhood, I, as I begin to think of, so how are we laying the foundations for what I want that person to be able to do when they're 20? Um, we, we want them to have the kinds of discussions that you know, Jamie was talking about with the books and, and, and I, you know, Vivian's one of my heroes in terms of <laughs> the stuff that she describes in her work. Um, it's, I, I've asked the question in other places, can we uh, both teach kids to trust authority and question it at the yeah. same time? So I think that's a really important question for us to keep asking, and also to keep in mind that this is about discernment skills, which we're already working with kids with. How do we discern what's a trusted source and what's not, or what's good for me and what's not? Uh, you know, that kind of thing. Because ultimately, and a lot of the conference, for those of you who are staying for Namely, is about um, news literacy stuff, right? But ultimately, all of that depends on disposition. Mm -hmm. You have to want to fact check in order for fact checking to be effective in any kind of way, right? You have to want to go look at whether that source. You have to want to bother to pay attention. We, as early childhood people, can nurture that disposition of I want to be intellectually curious, right? And, and we can use inquiry skills. I think, I think most early childhood educators need a whole lot more support in how you do inquiry with young children. But, but to develop those habits of inquiry, as Namely's um, purpose statement for the core principle says, I, I think that's what the core of our work is going to look like. Any thoughts? Or Yes. Find a librarian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. 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 Because that's what school librarians and public librarians are all about. So they, I mean, they're already trained right. in that. So we need collaborate to. with a librarian. Yep. Right. Excellent. And Vivian? I think there's, you know, working from, from the, the question of if my students leave my classroom not being able to participate differently in the world out there, then we need to sort of step back and think about what we've actually taught them. So just to piggyback off of what, what Faith was saying, is really helping them to navigate the world. So reading the world as text. So everything out there is text. So for instance, you know, um, a very basic, basic question to be asking is, what is this text trying to do to me? And then working from there so that you're reading with it, you're reading against it, you're reading it from different perspectives. You know, so from a critical literacy perspective, what I want is for kids not to think about things in a very specific way. So that's not what I want to teach them. What I want to teach them is how to be able to, to read lots of different texts in lots of different ways so they become an informed citizen of the world as they engage with and read that world. So it's more about sort of creating this, this space for kids to, to develop a way of being and a way of thinking. Um, that extends beyond the classroom. Excellent. And, Thank and you. Different, um, and with digital technologies, what that means is ha helping kids see that digital technologies are powerful communications tools and all the time to be thinking about, and what are the people who are using those tools trying to say to mm -hmm. me or trying to do to me, right? And what can I do with them, right? That's the essence of it right there. Yeah. Excellent. Well, join me in thanking our amazing first panel. <laughs> really appreciate it. You guys. 
So we're going to, I'll let them um, step down, and we're going to move to a quick um, update from the field from Jenna Herzina. Jenna's around, ready? Okay. And um, so let me I'll, um, set us up here. So Jenna is from Erickson Institute. How many of you have been to Erickson Institute or any of their forums on these issues? Great. So they're in Chicago, um, an amazing early childhood um, graduate school there as well. Um, and Jenna has been part of a really interesting project um, that is uh, helped take our field um, in a lot of positive directions with this. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Jenna, and here is the clicker, and just press on that, that right thing there. Press okay. Awesome. Okay, well, I'm so excited to be joining you all today. I see so many familiar faces. I just saw so many of you just, what, a couple months ago at Ericsson. So I'm, I'm excited to share the work we've been doing. Um, I'm Jenna Herzina, the program manager at Ericsson Institute's Technology and Early Childhood Center. For those of you who do not know, we are a very tiny team, but mighty Alexis, Laura, Sella, and I. So we're housed in Ericsson Institute, which is a hub of complex, creative thinking that empowers adults to help children reach their fullest potential. We're located in Chicago. So Erickson is fully, solely focused on children ages birth through age eight, as well as the adults um, and systems that support these young children. We're a graduate school. Um, Erickson has many professional development programs, community-based programs. We're also a hub of applied research, and we impact uh, leadership policy and advocacy, mainly in Illinois. The Tech Center was founded by Chip Donahue in 2012 as a center committed to empowering uh, early childhood educators and parents to use technology appropriately and meaningfully. The primary focus was on disseminating the information from the NAEY Seaford Rogers Center joint position statement on media, literacy, on media and technology uh, that our, our founding director co-authored. The Tech Center's mission is built on these three pillars, research, uh, practice, so we have a Tech Mentors Professional Development Program, as well as leadership. So the Tech, the tech Center's goal is to act as both a leader and a convener uh, in the field to ensure that the best practices are being collected and communicated with everybody who needs to know this information. And so at the Namely, pre, or at the Namely Conference in 20. 17 in Chicago, uh, we hosted the early childhood pre-conference, and after this pre-conference, we were encouraged to continue this work and apply for an IMLS grant. And so we realized this, that media literacy in early childhood at its core is focused on helping young children begin to understand uh, the role of media and preparing them to be creative, healthy media consumers as well as producers. But thus far, there's been a lack of consensus of really what media literacy looks like for children ages birth through five. Therefore, we applied for the grant that we were encouraged to, and in t April 2018, we were awarded a $100,000 IMLS grant in partnership with, Asso with the Association for Library Service to Children Association of Children's Museums, and namely, together we're leading a media literacy in early childhood um, alliance through two forums and a report. And so the goals of these two forums were to bring together uh, national leading organizations and thought leaders to collaborate and establish a framework um, for media literacy um, for young children ages birth through five and form a connected ecosystem of existed committed media literacy education providers as well as extend the reach and expand the number of organizations and individuals committed to integrating media literacy into their programs. 
So our first forum was this past January. We invited about 20 national media literacy leaders representing organizations such as the AAP, ISTE, Common Sense, Higher, higher Education Institutions, PBS, etc. Can I see a raise of hands for anybody who may have attended this forum? Thank you. Our goal was to create a single vision of media literacy for children birth through five. Working with the national leaders, we dug into the original established uh, definitions of media literacy and really talked about what words, action skills um, represented these youngest children. Ultimately, we concluded that while the definition that parents, educators, and practitioners are seeing and using is very important, what is even more important is this vision of what media literacy should look like and how should parents, uh, educators, and practitioners support and teach media literacy for young children. And we did walk away with a list of seven media literacy skills which are developmentally relevant for children birth through five. Our second forum was this past April. We invited 35 to 40 uh, practitioners representing various museums, libraries, schools, community-based organizations from across the country for a two-day deep dive into media literacy in early childhood. If you attended this forum, can you raise your hand real quick? Thank you. Our goal was to begin developing the framework. Um, so we discussed the abilities needed to learn the established seven skills of media literacy, how to support the abilities, how to offer effective media literacy education programs. Um, we split up into settings, basically settings that we work in. So there was a librarian group, a museum group, et cetera, and we talked about what is unique about those different settings? How do you teach media literacy in those different settings? What are unique barriers um, to overcome? We considered resources, discussed what types of information, research, training do practitioners need, what already exists, and what barriers are there besides a lack of funding and professional development? So, Coming soon, utilizing the discussions from these forums, uh, the Media Literacy and Early Childhood Framework will be released in this November for dissemination by the Tech Center and our partner organizations. This report will include Child Development 101, what media literacy looks like in early childhood, as well as um, specific examples of activities or lesson plans for these very specific settings. Uh, you'll be able to download the report from Tech Center's website, which is on this slide. Um, and so this is where you come in through April. There will be a huge push for dissemination, and so with your Permission will be emailing this report to you. Um, so please reach out to your networks to get this out. And if you have any um, burning questions, feel free to write them on the on your thought bubble on your table, um, and we'll hopefully answer them throughout the day. Thank you. I'm really excited for that report and for what it can do for us um, to really move move forward. So we're going to turn now to um, what, what I'm calling flash talks. Essentially, I have um, corralled some amazing people to give um, pretty quick talks on some work that they've been doing. Um, and then we're going to have time after that for some question and answer of the people who've done the presenting, as well as anything you've been kind of hearing and absorbing over this past hour. Um, so what, what's going to happen is we got, and you can see it in the agenda there, there'll be kind of four talks, one after the other. I'm not going to come up in between them. I'm just going to go one past um, the next. And the focus of this is to really help us think about what adults are going to need to be able to really provide 
the kinds of experiences we're talking about for today's kids. Um, so professional development, professional learning um, is really at the core of these next set of talks. Um, I'm going to quickly just tell you everyone who's going to come up, um, and then we'll start with the first group. We'll have um, a group from Maryland first. That's Connie Strittmatter and Dorothy Stoltz and Pam Hanlon, who have been working on um, a really amazing project that I feel very privileged to also have been part of for the past year and a half across many counties in Maryland. Um, and then after them, we're going to have um, Peggy Ashbrook, who is um, an amazing science educator. And I'm also very lucky that she was a science educator for my own children because she is a national expert in this. So it's really just like somehow the stars were aligning that um, we got Peggy. Um, and actually, my, one of my daughters is here. I'll just quickly. She might not be in the room this very minute, but um, Gigi's been helping me as well. So um, and then after, after Peggy speaks, then um, Sabrina Burroughs is going to come up. And she is going to um, speak about Eagle. I think, do I have the order right? I, I have it wrong, sorry. It'll be Sabrina Burroughs and then Peggy. Sabrina Burroughs, who's helping with a lot of things related to this event, is an educator at Eagle Academy Charter School here in DC um, and has just been doing some amazing things with the kids in her classroom. Um, and she'll tell you about how she became the teacher that she is today. And then lastly, we'll have Denise Chapman from Monash University in Melbourne, Australia, who is going to dazzle us with the presentation. She's a faculty member there who's working with prospective teachers. I'm going to stop talking and let our very next group come up so we can get started. Um, and we'll be timing you, so we will need to be under 10 minutes each. Thank you so much, Connie and Dorothy and Pam. There we go. Um, I'm Connie Stripmatter. I'm the Youth and Family Engagement Manager for Baltimore County Public Library. Um, and I'm talking to you about a project that Dorothy, uh, Dorothy and Pam have worked on with me over the past year and a half. Um, we set out to make sure that the librarians in our system, at the time I was in Harford County, Maryland, that they were prepared to be media mentors in the library. Um, and the reason why we really felt that we needed to be media mentors in the public library, we had a lot of reasons why, and you've heard some of them already. Um, one of them, oh, I didn't take these animations off, I always forget. Um, one of them is that we already have a lot of tech in the library as it is. If you're a public library user, you probably recognize some of these icons. These are all children's related materials that are already digital. And so for a very selfish reason, we felt if we don't prepare the children in our library setting to be able to use the materials we already have, they're not going to be able to use what we have in 20 years. It's going to be super futuristic to us now. So we need to get them prepared now. Um, we also already have a lot of other kinds of tech in the library that aren't necessarily very traditional. Um, things like virtual reality and augmented reality and 3D printing. And uh, if, we're, if we're bringing these things in to wow our customers, we also need to have our staff ready to mentor the children and families that come in to use these materials. And we also know that tech is becoming more prevalent in schools as well. This is an image from a Baltimore County school where they had a, have a one-to-one -one ratio with a device to children. So we know that children are coming in in kindergarten and taking assessments on tablets or on laptops. So if they don't have those skills coming in, and not all of them do, then they're being tested not only on the material but also on the testing device itself. Uh, so we felt that libraries were, uh, were uniquely positioned to reach these children and their parents before school starts, which isn't something that all schools and preschools are able to do. Uh, we also know that libraries are particularly interested in equity, and so we felt that the public library was the perfect place to be having this conversation when we know that, um, and if you can't see these statistics, 23% um, of low-income families do not have broadband internet, so that's mobile-only access. When we jump down, 41% of those families are Hispanic immigrants, and um, very sad to see that only 35% of mobile-only children look things up they're interested in online, which is a lot of what public libraries are about, is that freedom for um, children and, and people in general to just access what they're interested in. And so if we know that the devices are in the hands of the children, but their ability to access what they're interested in isn't, then the library is a place where we can help bridge that gap. Uh, so. We, we know that libraries are well positioned because we need to, in order to survive, uh, the schools have this technology, we need to prepare children, and we are uniquely concerned about equity, um, and we can reach 
the children and the parents at the same time. Um, we also asked our question, what's the alternative? We know that we get a lot of pushback from families um, where I've heard many families say um, that the library should be a sanctuary, that it's not the Apple store. Um, and to that I say, um, or I, I don't say this directly because it sounds snarky. <laughs> But um, we're not the Apple store, and that's, that's really the point is that we, the alternative to public libraries doing this, the other public spaces that have been created for this type of education are all commercial. So when you consider that a family might instead go to Google or go to the, the Apple store, they might be wonderful people working there, but the ultimate goal of those organizations is money, and that's not our goal. Um, so we decided that we needed to um, bring staff up to speed. Uh, we wanted to know what the, the parents in the community wanted. Uh, so we did some, uh, some focus groups and we did some assessments of the staff and we learned that they really just needed to be brought along. I'm sorry, I'll let you take a picture of that. We, we learned that really the staff um, were interested but they just didn't really see that new media was part of the scope of libraries. So what we did was we took six, that's Harford County, we took six lead coaches and we trained them on three ways uh, to be a media mentor through becoming a media mentor. It's a great book, you should definitely read it. And basically, very simply, I'm gonna rush through because I have two other people coming after me. Um, there are three ways to be a media mentor, advisory, programming, and curation. And once we told all the librarians that that's what it means to be a media mentor, they all said, oh, I'm a media mentor, that's really cool. I mean, it was, it was almost that simple. I have so many stories I could tell you later. But um, we trained, we took those six librarians, we trained Baltimore and Carroll counties, and we've then now been training other counties, and there's more than just those arrows. Um, and that's been a really great experience because we've seen a lot of enlightened librarians in this process ready to be media mentors now. So. Good morning, my name is Pam Hamlin and I'm the Family Literacy Specialist with the Prince George's County Memorial Library System. We're right to the east of DC and we have 19 branches in the County Correctional Center. I do most things with uh, birth to five in the branches. And um, basically, I've, we were able to reap all the hard work that Lisa and Dorothy and Connie did and we had a professional development day in Prince George's County this spring where we had 35 librarians from all over the state of Maryland. I think we had 11 um, library systems represented and we had a media mentorship training. And what I really wanted, my goal was to let librarians know, as Jamie and Connie have said, that they were media mentors already and that we just needed to um, sort of push them to realize that they can do this with technology and media. Um, you know, we're doing it through when we're advising people, we're doing it through our programming and, um, and the things that we curate. And even with our youngest customers, our, our preschoolers, we, um, during our story time, sometimes the librarians will use apps to project a book or sometimes an interactive app like the Mother Goose on the Loose that Jamie showed earlier so that parents can see that they don't just have to give their child a tablet, but that there are um, really high quality materials that we have as digital resources through our library websites and on the, the App Store. And we give literacy tips and fun things so that they know that they can um, make this a part of their interaction with their child, just like a book, that they should be with their kids doing this together for short periods of time to get them ready. Um, the pictures here, I guess I have here, is some VR in one of our smaller branches that's actually connected with an elementary school. So to follow up on what the teachers were doing in school, the kids had VR trips um, to learn about volcanoes and the Wild West. And we also have a lot of 3D printing. Let me see if I can do this. Nope. Which one? Oh. And with the, the 3D printers, our teens actually made a storybook um, trail. And so outside of the library, they put up the Very Hungry Caterpillar. The teens did it for their younger siblings and friends to um, go around and, so this is a different kind of technology, to see the book and touch the book and see it as they did a storybook walk outside. So that's just one of the things that we're doing in Prince George's County. Thank you.
Well, good morning. I'm Dorothy Stoltz, Director for Community Engagement with Carroll County Public Library. And one of our top priorities is to offer new and emerging technology and digital media to our library customers and patrons. So the goal is to have them try something new and to have a quality interactive experience with it. So things like robotics, coding, augmented reality. And we offer this inside and outside the library. So it includes going to places like the Boys and Girls Club and the county fair. And we also have green screen technology, uh, 3D printing, as well as uh, virtual reality. And this is using an, a high-end uh, VR equipment. Um, and we offer some in-depth workshops, such as helping families explore PBS online resources. Uh, we're also strategically um, planning how to um, offer mini courses and certifications on things like laser engraving, 3D printing, virtual reality, and cybersecurity. Uh, staff need to support each other as libraries are changing uh, our services. So the peer coaching project was perfect for us. And we used the uh, Becoming a Media Mentor book um, for a book club. And we offered it first to children's librarians, um, but we had adult services and circulation staff who were eager to participate as well. Uh, so the project has been supporting, as Connie and Pam mentioned, libraries uh, throughout Maryland. And librarians are developing their skills and increasing their ability to be media mentors. So we really appreciate it. It was an LSTA grant, an IMLS-funded uh, uh, project for us. And it was so wonderful that Lisa was able to be a part of it. friends. I call my students friends because I am their friend from August to June. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm Sabrina Burroughs and I need to find the clicker button. Uh, no, that's not me. Oh, the one that's been rubbed off. No. I'm almost there. Is that me? No. Sorry about that. No worries, I'll find, okay, there I am. Okay, hi, so I'm a tech mentor and I'm also an early childhood teacher at Eagle Academy Public Charter School right, right here in Washington, D.C. We have three locations. Um, I work at the location near the Navy Yard and a couple years ago we were charged to um, talk about the innovation because we were the first early childhood school, pre-K three through third grade in Washington, D.C. Our founder, Cassandra Pinckney, has passed away but she wants to continue what we do. Uh, we're doing a lot of things with innovation and I am a career changer, not sure why, but I have a bachelor's degree in computer information systems and I decided to get a master's in early childhood education when I changed my career years ago when my son's preschool teacher quit and I took over. Haven't looked back since, I absolutely <laughs> love what I do. Um, they happened to send a couple of years ago, they sent out an email asking the, if there's anyone who wants to deliver more innovation to our learners. Um, and there was an application process, they wanted to know how you would create this innovation, how you would incorporate technology into our learning, and why it would be important to do so. I filled out the application, got really excited, because it was literally just merging my two careers together and bringing about a process where I could officially bring tech and media into my learning environment across subject area. So as I was doing that, I coupled up with Erickson Institute, and there were about 20 plus of us, and I am um, happy to say that I'm still doing exactly what I was charged to do by bringing more tech into my classroom and then expanding what we're already doing. One of the things that I really like about the program is that Erickson set a goal. They wanted us to come out. They wanted us to develop, process, plan, evaluate, and deliver to three-year-olds. 
They want us to deliver the tech, deliver the tech process, but then encourage them to expand their problem solving and creative thinking by literally just using media as a part of their resources as they were learning. So we had dramatic play, we also had tech that was incorporated into dramatic play. They could make a video, make a story, they could do all sorts of fun things. But one of the other things that we were charged to do as tech mentors was deliver it to the teachers because if you don't deliver it to the teachers in the classroom, you don't get a buy-in. So we had what's called tech tinker time. And with tech tinker time, you can say that five times fast, um, <laughs> we were able to literally take the teachers where the children were going. And it was so exciting to watch because the teachers literally just give them the technology and the kids go about doing it. We were charged to let the teachers do it, which was lots of fun. I know I don't have a lot of time, so I'm not gonna like read every single slide. A lot of the things that I do in my classroom is when, as I'm developing my lesson plans, I have a little column on the side that says technology or media integration. So it becomes a part of my planning process when I'm planning uh, a lesson that has to be delivered on plants or um, landforms or even something like the human body or um, something as simple as book study. I use technology to be the useful. So it's not necessarily I just give the kids an iPad. I say, how are you going to develop a different process? What are you going to do? In my classroom, I have tech captains and my students literally just take over they know to go in the, in the cabinet and grab any media resource they want. It's not only iPads, we have light boxes, we have little robots, we have all sorts of different things. And I teach kindergarten currently. And my kindergartners can literally navigate all of the systems that they need to because I deliver it to them in the beginning, the first six weeks of school through um, a process, well, to educators in the room, we do um, a process that I can't think of right this second, but <laughs> it's, um, where we introduce it, we model, we kind of give them an oversight, and then we just let them go for it. I can't think of it. Um, so with purposeful, developmentally, developmentally appropriate technology, you have to make sure that the, what we're doing in the classroom is age appropriate. I'm not going to ask my six-year-olds how they're going to develop a skeleton using human, I'm sorry, uh, fossils. I can, but I don't. I don't tell them what to do. I tell them, here are the resources. Here's what we might lead to doing. How are you going to do it? I was also encouraged this year to, um, last, I'm sorry, last year in Pittsburgh, I went to the makerspace training for makerspace education. So in my classroom, as in, in addition to technology, I also incorporate makerspace. So I have a huge makerspace area where they have all sorts of tools and resources. And with these resources, they're able to open their minds, think about things, and then they expand it by making a video production or a storybook or um, capturing a moment where they're sending a message to their parent, an audio message or video message to their parents. They know how to do that. I think that technology and media can be limitless and precise. And I think that with the challenge that we have at my school, um, and I do like what Faith said, I made a lot of notes since this morning, so I know it's gonna be a very powerful day. Um, media opens up the mind in the classroom. Media promotes problem solving. Media, I'm sorry, my glasses are. Media encourage, crit encourages critical thinking. Media expands vocabulary. A media allows for construction and deconstruction of documentation, whether it's digital or print. And media helps us to solve our problems or process our thoughts. So one of the things that I like to do in my classroom is encourage the students to solve problems, to figure it out, to work together, to build a partnership, and then to navigate how they're going to talk about it because it opens up communication, it opens up a conversation. And I think that it's a resource that is necessary, but we have to get a buy-in from all other educators, all policymakers, and even the evaluators that evaluate us as teachers to make sure that we're incorporating these resources into our learning process. Thank you.
Good morning. Thank you, Lisa, and all of you for inviting me here today to share a bit about my work. I'm relatively new to understanding the importance of media literacy education, but I am experiencing experience in helping young children and their teachers use evidence to support their claims or their statements of understanding. And as a preschool science teacher, I've worked alongside teachers in a wide variety of programs, um, including public schools, half-day cooperative and full-day child care centers, and uh, Head Start programs, both uh, in DC and also in Northern Virginia across the river. What they have in common includes the responsibility of caring for and educating young children and employing educators who may have little experience supporting children's engagement with natural phenomena. So how do we support developing curiosity and science knowledge in the child who comes to us asking, what is this? And because I want children to think about their own prior experiences and knowledge, I usually respond with, well, what could it be? Or what do you think it is? And what makes you think that? And they might hesitate because they don't really know exactly what it is. So I prompt them with some kind of unlikely suggestion like, well, is it a dog? And that usually helps children understand that they have enough knowledge to assign a beginning name to that animal and they tell me it's a bug. And then we can have a talk about what they know that makes them think it's an animal and specifically an insect. Conversations like this might lead to trying to understand uh, where it was found and why it was found in damp sand and what its needs are. And then the child might look for more of these insect pupa in other areas of the sandbox or search online with a teacher to get more information, beginning a science inquiry into the life of this animal. Science inquiry involves using the practices of science and engineering identified in a framework for K-12 science education and described in the Next Generation Science Standards. And that includes many practices that align with media literacy education goals of helping children access, analyze, evaluate, create, and act using all forms of communication. The practices describe what we want children to do as they investigate and build models and theories about the natural world, just as scientists do. Take a moment and look to see where you see the practices overlap with the media literacy inquiry. I think practices four, six, seven, and eight particularly involve creating and using media to understand and explain our explorations. And in early childhood, using these practices helps educators and children look and describe what they really see, not what they expect to see or what they think they see, and also to wonder and think about it. If they have seen images in media with uh, insects of happy faces with big smiles, they might not recognize actual insect mouth parts or the compound eyes when they see them. They have to look closely and of course talk about what they see. When talking with preschool teachers about practice seven, engaging in argument from evidence, we note that evidence sounds like something from a television detective show or what a real scientist might do, a working scientist. But young children also have their reasons for the ideas they hold. Their observations along with any counting, measuring, pattern finding, or comparing that they do are the evidence that children can talk about with the other scientists in their community, their, their classroom, their peers, their teachers, and then their families. So let me talk just a little bit about using evidence in early childhood science experiences. Testing for sinking and floating is a very common early childhood science experience that engages children in thinking about the why of daily occurrences in a puddle or in the bath. Educators use it to make a hypothesis which is based on a child's prior experience or a fun small group activity for recording data, listing or drawing the objects that sank and those that floated on a chart. The why involves the phenomenon of density, and that's a difficult concept to understand, even when we have years of experience with objects of different weights and densities. People often use the concepts of heavy and light to explain why they think things float or sink. 
And a child might explain that an object sank because it was heavy. And a teacher might confirm that, saying, yes, heavy things sink. And even after observing something that is very heavy, like a pumpkin, and observing it floating, children and adults might continue to say that big objects, heavy objects, sink, unless they document it, what they observe, and then they use that evidence from their documentation to reflect on the beginning understanding, thinking that everything heavy sinks, and then see how it changed. And you could see that the children and the educators have had this experience so that they can talk about it together. As Sabrina said, uh, educators in all programs need to time to experience science inquiry themselves in order to appreciate how exciting it can be and how children develop their understanding of natural phenomena in their explorations. And educators need time to examine their own understandings. Our early ideas might seem intuitive, but they need to be tested when supported with evidence to confirm with scientific reasoning. Talking with children about their documentation helps them understand how others view their drawings or photographs. Just last week, a child was showing her drawing to me of her family, and she was saying, well, that's me, and that's my mother. And then she paused, and she looked at the drawing again, and she said, no, that's my mother, because she is bigger. So initially in her drawing, she had a different view of who was who, and then she realized that the viewer's perspective was going to be something different. Understanding what messages our drawings or photographs are telling others is part of learning how media content is made. When we put cameras into children's hands, we should also print or view the photographs and talk with children about what they see, why they took that photo, and what they want it to tell other viewers. I like to put cameras into children's hands. It's always interesting what they find important. A children's printed photograph of an animal might not be at the actual size, and that could mislead viewers who are not familiar with an animal unless there's a frame of reference, like somebody might put a coin down next to an animal to show what size it is. And in my writing and in my mentoring with educators, I encourage them to ask children about their photographs. Is this image an accurate representation of an animal? Or is it an accurate image enlarged or reduced in size? Or is it even an altered photograph? And how can we let viewers know this? We can help children evaluate images of any kind created by others by recalling their own prior experiences and looking at additional resources. Every time we read a book to children or view digital media with them, a few minutes can be spent on media literacy education, asking children open-ended questions to help them analyze what they see and what message is intended. And this is a photograph from a conference, a National Science Teachers Association conference, or maybe a National Association for the Education of Young Children conference, where the uh, vendor allowed us to take photographs with a very, very large spider image. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sorting here. Um, we're going to just pop through and bring up my amazing friend from Melbourne who is also from Virginia. And some of you may know that I have family in Australia. So I feel incredible kinship with Denise. Um, all right, Denise. Oh, beautiful. Actually, I want you to stay up here because yes. um, I, um, I had to bring something in from Australia. So these are like. You, you can't eat them all at once, okay? Uh, you, you can't eat them all. Well, you could, you could, but, but I, I just had to bring that in because you've been just so beautiful, and uh, I appreciate you letting me join in. Oh, you're so wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's see. I thought it was uh, great to, uh, to end here uh, with a spider um, that was up that actually looked like a spider that I would see every day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let me start my timer here. Um, uh, my name is Denise Chapman. Um, I uh, teach at Monash University in, in Melbourne, Australia. I am from the U.S., so sorry, y'all. Uh, 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 but I can every now and then say something uh, very Aussie-like, you know, g'day, mate, that's not a knife, and stuff like that. <laughs> um, now, um, I'm, I'm here, and 
I, I'm a storyteller. Okay, I, I'm having difficult. I'm gonna move this chair. Okay, so I'm a storyteller, and I'm, I'm here just to tell you a story. Okay, I'm gonna tell. It's a good ending. It's a good ending. Uh, but I'm really here to tell you a story about what our students, our pre-service teachers at Monash, who are in the early childhood primary, aka um, elementary, um, are, are thinking when it comes to media mentorship. Um, this is a dua ethnography. Um, uh, this is our way of storying and theorizing about what was happening in our classrooms because this is a fourth year unit or class and <coughs> our, our students end up seeing us at the end and, and it's interesting because they don't necessarily want to see us okay? uh, because they get a little scared. I'm not going to get into that bit. Um, but I am going to get, I know, uh, uh, friends, but I had to. Uh, oh, I need to be loud. There we go. Thank you. Um, uh, so I want to set the scene. I want to set the scene as a storyteller and tell you that there, we have students that are coming in and we're telling them about new media. It's new media and technology in the early years in primary. And their idea of what being a media mentor is, is I have to use technology. And the, um, uh, the actual curricula that we have and it, it is inconsistent. It's inconsistent. And I'm trying to forge what's going on here over there. All right. Can you hear me? Forge over there. There. Okay. Ozzy, ozzy, ozzy. Oi, oi, oi. Wheels on the bus go. Okay. I just want to make sure you're with me. All right. So... I um, and oh, isn't that lovely? Look at the S. We'll just look every time you see a typo, clap. Okay. Um, we are, um, so I am a storyteller. I have these same students for early childhood, um, um, uh, early childhood um, literacy, uh, or, uh, um, literature, children's literature. Um, and, um, and so for me, everything is about story. And so what I was having to do, or what I was finding myself in this predicament was that I was trying to create a story for my students to see themselves as what? What? Okay, as media mentors. And so I had some themes that were running through the story, some themes running through the story. I wanted them to see this as an everyday way of being. I wanted them to be able to see that this was intertwined in their everyday social practice. Um, I wanted them to be able to see that, you know, tech is, is it's, it's not a scary thing, okay? I wanted them to have faith. Literally, faith. Um, uh, okay, uh, I wanted them to know this. So, in many ways, uh, faith wrinkle. Okay. Um, so, in many ways, I was having to restory what this dominant discourse that they had inculcated in their minds, because many of the early childhood educators saw themselves as, well, technology. Mm. No. And these are the unspoken, implicit things that are being said. They, no one wants to talk about it, but it's happening. So I needed to recenter them as pre-service teachers about to go out into the field, and I wanted to see themselves as the protagonists in their media mentorship story. Okay? I wanted them to believe believe in what they could do. So I needed to restory. But in order to do that, um, we, my uh, co-author um, uh, co here with this duo ethnography, uh, who's also my PhD student, um, uh, Megan Brown, Dr. Brown, soon to be Dr. Brown, um, we wanted us, we wanted to be able to see themselves as confident leaders, right? Okay, we wanted to see themselves as, as seeing, well, you know, to, to, to not drink the Kool-Aid, okay, that they were believing that, that it was a myth that, that they as early childhood educators could actually be media mentors. Um, so I wanted to counter the narrative. I wanted to clap back at that narrative. And also, every now and then, Megan and I would go, are you seeing what I'm seeing? She's like, yeah, I'm seeing the same thing. Oh, gosh, we're in trouble. Okay. So um, we, we had to counter narrative a lot of these myths that they had, a lot of these myths, you know, that uh, the digital natives, uh, you know, that 
you know, old teachers don't, don't use technology, um, that, you know, technology wastes time, okay? These are all these myths that they're in their head and I'm trying to clap back at, okay? I'm trying to clap back at. Um, and um, because it's permeating um, and it's, it's, it's uh, contagious. So, um, we were doing storytelling as a methodology, storytelling as a, um, uh, as a means of being able to disrupt that dominant discourse. And so, but in order to do that, we needed to find out, and I'm just gonna zoom through a few of these. Um, we needed to find out, well, where are they? What, who do they see themselves? What kind of character are they? Okay, not to label them, Okay, but to say, okay, we're gonna story you to this type of protagonist, okay? And so we did that through my colleague and I, through doing diary notes, histories, uh, personal histories, reflections, and we came up with some uh, pop culture uh, memes and tweeting for the students and being able to sort of show them, like, are you feeling this way? Tell us about it. And so I'm gonna very quickly just zoom through. These are some of the things that they saw themselves as, but a good story is that in the end, they saw themselves as the strong media mentors that they were. So some of the students were going, um, uh, uh, you know, aggressively resistant, Mr. Anderson. I ain't doing nothing. Okay, um, or we had some, um, no Back to the Future, please. No, 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 I'm not interested. Uh, we had some damsel in, in, in distress. Oh, Lord, I, you know, my, my son can do this for me. I'm just a female. And then I went, and, and the, the, the side eye doesn't quite work as well in Australia, but that's okay. Um, I'm too old for this sugar. Okay, um, uh, um, the, the, knights, uh, the knights that say no or knee, uh, the cyber snorlax. <sighs> I hate this class. <sighs> I don't want to be here. Um, the, uh, the misses, the misses, because many of our students were female, digital dot fire. I can't do this. And this is a different face um, than what I'm used to. Um, the door detouring and exploring. Okay, they're like, yeah, Denise, I know that we got to do this, but I'm like, get back on track, girl. Okay, um, and um, the thawing squirrely uh, squirrel that got the nut, they're just so close, but they're like, oh. um, the yippee yay yay mother fuckers. There we go, yeah. Um, I didn't say that word, okay. Um, um, but they were like, yeah, I'm gun ho And that's many of our um, male students. In, um, uh, uh, and, and which was very infuriating to some of our other students. So we needed them to play, we needed them to feel the sense of belonging and being, to transform, to change what was in their minds. Emancipate yourself from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds, okay. And that's great, just to be critical, not to prejudge, and thank you. What fun, and um, thank you all. So another round of applause for our Flash Talk presenters. Uh, so I know you've got questions out there, or you're thinking about, hey, Whoa, 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 wait, what was that again? Um, so now I've got 10 minutes to ask questions. I'll just kind of moderate it from up here and we'll have mics go around to help people. You need the mic, thank you, Riker. Um, be able to ask their questions because we are, the folks um, who are watching in the live stream wanna be able to hear your question as well. When you ask a question, just keep it really, really short. Tell us your name and your organization and then get straight to your question. Um, so for those of you who may wanna, and, and it, it can be of course to our presenters, um, but you may also wanna ask Faith and Jamie and Vivian something as well as Jenna. So please, so who is our first person with a, a question? Um, about what we've just heard this morning. Anything out there? This one in the back. Yeah, I have a question for Vivian, who's sitting right next oh, to me. Oh, and tell us your name. My name's Devin, I'm a science writer. And I really appreciated how you talked about uh, reading the text forward and reading the text backward, and uh, uh, particularly about youth being able to extract their own meaning and a variety of meanings, and I'm I'm troubled by the fact that at least in public schools, 
I see youth being evaluated and graded based on getting the meaning, whether it's the symbolism or something else out of the text. And so that seems like real, a real dissonant way of evaluating. I just wondered if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, I mean, lots, definitely. But um, um, I think, you know, it's sort of thinking about, and I know that one of the things that, that, that was going around was this idea of, you know, what are the basics? What, what do kids need? And I think we can't really go back to the basics as they were because kids today are just so, so different. They live different lives. So I think one of the things I always tell my students is get to know your kids, really get to know your kids, get to know their, their, you know, their, their families, get to know the community that you're in, get to know your colleague, get to know what it is that you're being told that you need to do, what you're being mandated to do backwards and forwards so that you can then step aside and create spaces to do the work that you know is important to be done. And you know, once you can sort of figure out and navigate how to create those small spaces, you can create bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger spaces so that it becomes sort of a way of being, a way of thinking, whatever setting that you're in. Um, and then it becomes, I mean, I mean, those comprehension questions, I mean, what we do from, you know, an inquiry-based theory of learning, from a, from a critical literacy perspective, far exceeds anything that, that you know, that, that could go on when using sort of the, those more dominant ways of, of engaging with literacy in classrooms. And that's true for very young children as it, as it is for, for older children as well. So I don't know if that kind of answers your question. And feel free, others who might want to respond to, to that as well, because there's a lot to unpack in that question also about um, policy and where data gathering from standardized tests is coming from and how how different children are being themselves evaluated. Let's go to an, another question. There's someone who wants to ask something of one of our speakers. Yes, please, um, tell us your name and your organization. Hi. I, I'm Renee Shiro O'Leary. I'm an educator, a longtime media literacy advocate. Um, I'm curious about the families, because we've heard about the librarians, the teachers, and the children. And I just wonder, where are the parents and families who either don't have the access to the resources or who really feel the same kind of anxiety about uh, using these materials? Is there something else that's going on in the, in the family setting? Yeah, so do any of our, our speakers might want to speak to that? I know that our librarian group, yeah, Connie, and, and then maybe Jamie as well and others. Yeah, Connie will answer that. There you go. Uh, hello. Yeah. Here we are. Um, so one of uh, one of the stories that I um, that I like to tell in the process of the the media mentorship peer mentoring uh, program that the library did that my system did, um, we had two librarians in one branch um, who were working with the same lead coach, and one of them said that she really didn't enjoy using technology in her story time. She didn't feel like the families needed it. None of them asked for it. And so she never used it. Um, and nobody ever asked her about it, and she thought it's, it's not necessary. Same exact branch, different librarian, same audience, same families, uses technology in her story times, and says families ask her about it all the time. And so, you know, what we learned there, it was such a great um, moment where we, it's, it's kind of, it feels obvious, but it's great when you actually see it happen, where um, when the librarian is bringing that technology to the families, the families realize, oh good, you're a person I can talk to about this. And so the library is really working on being that place where families can come in. And so we do that by either putting the technology out on the floor in a very passive way where we curate the content that's on that device so that it is educational, um, and then we wait for the families to come ask us because now they see us as that resource. Or we make a point in our programming to um, to include that kind of technology, we certainly get some pushback from families, but we feel that the good that it's doing far outweighs that one parent who, like I said before, might say, this is a sanctuary, which I've heard twice from two different people. <laughs> the library is a sanctuary. Um, and so we put it in programming, we put it out on the floor in a curated way, um, and we also incorporate it into any of our reference work that we do. So when a family comes up and says, you know, uh, my child's doing a project on trains, 
um, can you help us find materials? A lot of us might naturally say, let's go to the stacks and find that material for you. But we're really retraining ourselves to say, well, what other digital content might exist? Because that's where so much of it is. So those families start to see us as a resource because we are free and accessible to everybody. So that's been our mission. Um, and that's one of the ways we're doing it. Yeah, I think Sabrina and Jamie both had a, a comment on that. I just wanted to add to that, even though I do the guided discovery in my classroom for my students, at the end of each theme or thematic unit, um, I invite, as a tech mentor, I invite my parents to come into the classroom so they can learn, see, and do as their children are doing. And because we're a Title I school, we don't have those resources that we can send out to the families. So a lot of times it's those families coming in as opposed to this, just giving their students um, their cell phone and saying, go for it. They're actually seeing what we're doing in a thematic way. So it's purposeful and they're seeing how to integrate that into what they're doing at home. And so just kind of picking up on both what Connie and Sabrina said too, it's also though for libraries, not just being in the library, it's the outreach. So like in the city where I live, it's the bookmobile going out, but not just giving books, they give out books too, but they also have a digital petting zoo where they're showing how to use the technology. They're, and in, if they're doing story times, in addition to the program they're doing, they're also showing how to do that co-engagement with, with the technology. They're you know, modeling it, and then they're giving activities to the families to take home and do it, and they also checking out that device with them too. So it's, it's, you know, it's, so it is, the families are getting it, and they don't even have to come to the library to get it. We'll come to you. And some of it is also partnering with child care agencies to offer it. I just might add a quick thing as well um, to this excellent pieces here. I'm, I'm realizing as well that many families start with questions about digital well-being, which absolutely are, are part of this broader conversation. So they start with questions about how do I maybe keep my child from some of this, because some of it we do need to keep <laughs> children from. And that's an, an opening, right? That's a place where um, librarians and teachers can kind of show that I, I get you, I understand that you've got some concerns here, let me show you some tools. And then it also opens up a path for conversation about learning and literacy in, in, the, in the next step. Um, let's take another question. My name is Summer Jones. I'm with Zero to Three. And um, just really piggybacking off of what you just said, that was a perfect segue. Um, so my thought is going to infants and toddlers and uh, maybe these families who are coming into the public libraries or their young children are in a preschool setting. So I'm wondering kind of what is the messaging um, for those families, for those parents who might take this information and think, oh great, now I can just hand my cell phone to my two-year-old and say, go run with it. So I'm just curious, you know, how does the messaging work um, for that? Does anyone want to take that? One of our various speakers? Yeah, Connie can get us started. So um, one of the things that we did in our project was we actually, we did, um, focus groups with families and we went to different areas of the county so we made sure we hit different socioeconomic um, areas while we did that and it was interesting to learn from we, we talked to one family one uh, mom who it so, sort of I, su I suppose the word admitted might work that she does do that she hands the the device to her child she's also a single mom who's getting a graduate degree and has she said no other real choice and so in that conversation with her what we talked about was how the library can be that resource for her to find the materials on that device for the child that makes it worthwhile um, one of the things she had expressed to us was she knows that her child knows how to use the device so she can just hand it to her but she also knows that her child sometimes finds not so great um, my little pony videos on YouTube <laughs> and so we said, oh, well, did you know that you can download YouTube Kids? Um, and this was pre-Momo, so, you know, that wasn't an issue at the time. Um, but we, we talked to her about YouTube Kids. We talked to her about setting guided access. We talked to her about all these different tools. And so those are the things that librarians can go in and do and say, here are the ways that you can hand that device to your child because we know that real life happens and that you will have to do that. I do that. Uh, I know I'm sure almost every parent in the room who has a device has done it to some extent, but how can you do it so that you have, you have created uh, a, a value system for them through the way that you use media and the way that you hand the media to the child? And you can use those tools on the device. Let's take one last comment from Denise and then we'll take a break. Um, I, I, beautiful points. Um, I just wanted to, to, 
to think before that um, uh, because very often it's just the disposition of the teacher or the librarian to be able to um, to be a, a a means to go to you know because for it, and so if the teachers like uh, you know feeling some of the same things that the parent is feeling um, there's not going to be this this engagement in this conversation so I think disposition just remembering that that sense of disposition remembering that we need to you know to see ourselves much like um, uh, Jamie was talking about with uh, uh, Rudine Sims Bishop um, uh, uh, you know mirrors windows and sliding glass doors and being able to see it as an opportunity for us to be transformative and to see the future in it but I think that disposition is so that's the big one because very often from for me the teacher the pre-service teachers are just like the parents and so no one wants to admit anything they're like no no I don't do that I don't do that Right. We'll, we'll end there, and we're going to take uh, a 15-minute break. Um, well, maybe a little less than 15 minutes. We're going to get started again as close to 11 o'clock as possible. Thank you all. And again, big thanks to all of our speakers that, so far this morning.
Start taking your seats. We're going to start again in just a few, less than a minute. Take, take a seat if you can. We're going to get started, and then we'll have another break in an hour uh, for lunch, which will be excellent and very necessary, I'm sure. If I can ask you all to have a seat, please. We're going to get started with the next session. I, I am not, I'm not one of those good people who's like cracking the whip, but I might have to crack the whip. 
So um, thank you again so much for all the conversation. Have a seat if you can. We're gonna we're gonna get started now. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. So um, hi everyone. Um, me again, Lisa. We're gonna we're gonna start with some updates um, for the field and from the field. Just a couple of really. Um, good announcements from leaders um, in our organizations that have been so supportive. And then we're going to get into a panel discussion that's going to go to some of the policy and research questions that may be on your mind. And then we get to have another break um, and pick up our lunches and uh, the uh, lunch um, lunch uh, discussion and content and entertainment is going to be fabulous. So I'm excited for that as well. Um, so without further ado, I am going to turn the podium over to Tony Streit. He is the president of Namely. He's also with Education Development Center in Chicago um, and was going to tell us a little bit more about Namely and some of the resources available to you. So Tony, thank you so much. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, I can only guess from the energy in the room and the challenge of getting you to settle down that the morning has been fantastic. I apologize. I was, um, I was over at American University for the kickoff of our research symposium, which also had the same level of energy. Um, and so I'm playing some catch up here. Um, but I'm really eager just to participate and be a part of this conversation. I've been at the um, gatherings at Ericsson. Um, I'm based in Chicago, so um, it's great to see everyone here. Um, I think the one thing I'll share, you know, I, I actually wear two hats. I'm, I'm on the board of Namely and have been involved for a long time. And, um, and at Education Development Center, I currently um, MPI on the National Center for After School and Summer Enrichment, which is one of the TA centers for ACF that looks across the whole CCDF program. And the one thing in both camps that I can share is this great need to support and prepare um, early educators um, to address media literacy in a more profound way. So, and I'm suspecting that's been the, the forefront of your conversation so far, um, that we're really seeing that change will come when we can really help those educators understand pedagogy and understand how to support young people. So, so really, I'm just very excited to be um, a part of the conversation. If you're here for the conference, um, welcome. It's really um, a dynamic week that we have ahead. Um, and so I hope to uh, meet many of you and um, help uh, welcome you to uh, DC later today. Thanks so much. And Susan Fried, we're very lucky to have Susan Friedman, who's Senior Director for Publishing and Professional Learning at NAEYC with us. Um, the National Association for the Education of Young Children is the premier organization for early educators, um, birth all the way up through middle of elementary school. Um, and so Susan's going to talk about a new publication that's in the works, and we wanted to make sure you all knew about it. So Susan. Hi, um, I know some of you and some of you I haven't met before, but you've written for us. So I want to make sure that I meet you in person. I just met um, Sabrina. So that was great. I've seen your writing for quite a while. Um, so National Association for the Education of Young Children is a membership organization for early childhood educators. We also do a lot of other work related to advocacy and I head up our publications department. We have books periodicals, um, digital content, and professional learning um, at our conferences and some online learning. And um, Lisa mentioned that there's an upcoming book, and um, Roberta in the back of the room just asked me about that upcoming. Um, basically, it is a little bit delayed, this book. It, um, it is with Chip Donahue and Tamara Caldor, and um, we're tentatively titling it um, making intentional decisions no matter the technology and basically the idea is that as technology moves and changes 
what are the things that teachers can do to make good decisions, no matter what the tech, technology is, so they don't get overwhelmed with, this is new, this is new, what do I do? Essentially, um, our belief is some of the same principles about good teaching and selecting good tools for your classroom apply um, when you're setting up your room, when you're choosing books, when you're deciding what toys and um, non-technology and media materials to include, and when you're making decisions about technology and media. So you could look for that book um, not soon, but in probably um, fall of 2021. A book takes a long time, and uh, but I also just wanted to mention a couple of other things to all of you while you're here. Um, there are some important things going on at NACI that I think that you should be aware of. Um, Tony just mentioned um, media literacy standards and materials for early childhood educators. NACI has just um, reworked our professional prep standards for early childhood educators and they're now on our website as our um, teacher competencies. They're within uh, um, an area of our website that has all, all our position statements and we have three new or revised very important position statements. There's a new draft of developmentally appropriate practice that's out there for feedback. Um, so if you, after it's complete, if you say, oh, there's nothing about media literacy in here, that's too late, but right now is actually not too late. You could go on to the website and add your comments and feedback. Um, the professional prep standards talk about technology and um, media and teacher use of technology and media, and you'll see it in the context of all the things that early childhood educators need to think about literacy, reading and writing, math, et cetera. So one thing that I will urge you is when you're thinking about media literacy and early childhood teachers, think about all the things they're trying to do. They're trying to teach each and every child. They're thinking about equity. They're thinking about kids and where they are gonna be when they're taking the third grade reading test. And so if you could think about it in context and um, in the context of everything else they have to do, I think that that would be most useful. So it's not to say that the standards aren't important or thinking about media literacy isn't important. It's just that I think that teachers become overwhelmed with like, oh, here's another thing I have to do. So that context is really important and we have a lot of vehicles for participating and sharing information with early childhood educators. Some of you have um, submitted to um, present at our next conferences that are coming up. Um, the selection process is extremely competitive so um, we had 500 more proposals around than we usually do. And so if you could think about who could make a panel um, when you submit to our next conference, that would be really useful. Because we had like, let's say I was, look, we had like six on television and great educational television programming. So, but if those were all together in one panel, then I think that would be a big plus. So just think about that. Um, think about being a peer reviewer we're gonna put a call out for peer reviewers for uh, conferences. We need more peer reviewers, and that is also a way that you can make sure that there's really high quality content at our conferences for people interested in media literacy. So, um, you know, I encourage you to reach out to me, um, submit your content, talk to me about it, and um, look for our book in a while. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, there's a lot there's a lot going on actually and the more that we can get involved in that and be kind of leaders and um, helping to to focus that's going to be incredibly important for everybody i want to now just point out a couple there's other um so there's so many amazing people in the room today um i'm really kind of dazzled myself by by just seeing so many of your faces and so much of what you've been able to provide to the field and I want to call on a couple of you um, so if we have mics available to just give a quick shout out to some different um, other resources that you will have out there Heather Sherwood thank you Heather there you are um, with EDC is here and they have several new um, publications that um, we wanted you to know about so if someone could bring a, a microphone over to Heather real quick she'll tell you about about those I'm Heather Sherwood from Education Development Center. We've got a bunch of materials, but when you came in, you might have seen these beautiful pamphlets um, integrating technology into early learning and supporting emergent bilingual students. These we've developed um, based on the idea that there's a lot of great research that's being done in these two strands. A lot of that we've talked about today with connecting with families, supporting the home culture, having students uh, be creators, not just consumers. But how do we get these tips into the hands of teachers that are uh, easy to implement, that are actionable and easy to digest? 
So what we did was a really extensive literature scan and came up with a list of best practices and created an actionable checklist for both integrating technology and supporting emergent bilinguals. Um, we've published these. These are available free um, in print, but they're also available on our website. We have them translated into Spanish, Chinese, and of course in English. And we also have them available in uh, low ink versions so that they're really easy to print to if you can't get your hands on you know, the beautiful PDFs. There are printable copies as well. Um, but I encourage everybody, if you haven't had a chance to take one, to please do. We've been sharing them in a lot of different outlets with Ericsson Institute blogs, and we'll be at NAEYC as well this fall. Um, but these are really great resources that hit on a lot of the things that we've talked about today. So please help yourself. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Heather, so much. And I also, um, Robin Mensher, is Robin still with us? Robin's over here. Great. Um, so Robin is here from KQED, which means that she, she didn't travel from Melbourne, but, you know, she came across the country um, here for Namely. Um, but KQED Teach, um, if, you've nev if you don't know KQED Teach, Robin's going to tell you what it is because it's an amazing resource, and KQED in general has been a, a great source. So Robin, you want to just give us a quick... Note. Thanks, Lisa, and good morning. Uh, KQED is public media uh, from the San Francisco Bay Area, and uh, in the room today are actually a lot of colleagues from the public media system. Can you raise your hand? PBS folks and stations, CPB, good morning. So all the folks who raise their hands, uh, we're part of a uh, system that, similar to public libraries is uh, available for communities offering free resources um, to build the connection between home, family, school, community uh, with and through media. And at KQED, uh, our focus has really uh, been on how to uh, take our expertise about media, media production, media and learning, and media literacy, and make it more accessible uh, for educators across the spectrum. And so KQED Teach is a free and open online resource of courses for educators uh, for pre-K through 12 to learn the skills about how to read, write, share, and teach with media. I put a few brochures on tables uh, across the room, the, um, the red brochures. Uh, in the courses, um, there are over 20 courses currently that individual uh, early childhood educators and teachers and informal educators can log on to find the course that they're looking for, whether it's about analyzing media or producing different types of media. Uh, it is a professional space for teachers to gather together and learn in community uh, when it's convenient for you. There are also uh, cohort or um, shared learning experiences available where you can sign up when courses are offered. Uh, and we can also work with organizations to provide a shared cohort learning experience for the educators in your community. So feel free uh, to touch base with me about that. Um, another thing that you'll hear about in the next panel uh, from uh, Sarah Shapiro from PBS is the PBS Media Literacy Educator Certification Program uh, that we've developed uh, in partnership with PBS to really incentivize and recognize professionals in the education field uh, who uh, really put media literacy um, at the forefront of their practice. So uh, looking forward to sharing more with you about that in a few minutes, and thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Robin. So we're going to move into um, um, a, a panel discussion. I want to call um, our, our panelists to come up. Um, and um, I think we might have been assigned, assigned chairs. I can't remember if our microphone guys had to tell you that. But we have Diana Malazuski, who's a teacher, librarian, and media literacy educator on the Toronto District School Board. Um, in fact, I will move around so you guys can hear me well. So Diana is going to be sitting next to me. So welcome, Diana. Carrie Sanders, who is the Youth Services Coordinator for the Maryland State Library. Sarah Shapiro, Vice President of PBS Education. And Katia Voigt, who is here with IREX. And she'll tell you more about IREX if you haven't um, heard. I just, myself, in the past three years have learned a lot more about IREX and their amazing resources that are global. She's the global lead for media and information literacy initiatives. Um, and and I will be moderating this one, but I promise that by the afternoon you won't see as much of me. I feel like I'm, 
<laughs> I'm, uh, um, I'm too, too, too much in the, in the space at this point, and I'm really looking forward to all of the really great questions that are going to come from the audience as well. So we're going to talk for um, about um, 30 minutes or so, and then open it up to some questions, and then we will break for lunch. Um, one of the reasons that we have this particular panel today is that um, we're sitting here in Washington, D.C. The, uh, well, it's not always the best place to be, depending on um, different kind of policies that are being put forward and debates and, and whatnot that we have to be having in this country. But it is the right place to be when it comes to trying to get the voice of policy makers and policy in influencers, and I'm sorry, get the ear of our policy influencers and policy makers. Also, of course, hear their voices. Um, and we can start that by having a conversation with educators in the room and with our librarians and with those who work with families to really kind of lift up what's needed and what policy changes um, are desperately needed to kind of bring about the kind of learning environments that we've been talking about this morning. So I'm going to start with Diana. Um, because being from Canada gives us all a little bit of hope, I think, that, <laughs> that there's, there are some new ways to do things. And, um, and hearing about how you've been able to do your work in Ontario, I think, could help to lead us into a discussion of some of the, the policy changes that we might imagine for the United States as well. So I'm going to start, Diana, with um, you telling us a little bit about how, to, how the standards that became part of um, Ontario and the work that you do in Toronto, um, how those have led to better media literacy practices in your classrooms. Okay, thanks Lisa, and thank you, welcome. Um, thank you, we feel very welcome. The, yes. the, the Canadian yes. contingent who has come to, uh, to Namley, yes, Canada represent. Um, yes. Yes. And the, the, the great thing is um, um, I'm proud to be from Ontario because Ontario was actually the first educational jurisdiction in North America to make media education a mandatory part of the curriculum. And that was all the way back in 1987, actually. Um, uh, that's OK, <laughs> though. Um, and the interesting thing, too, it was um, that it has survived. There's been ebbs and flows uh, with the different governments and stuff that have come in. Um, and it is possible within conservative governments and liberal governments and everything in between. Um, so sort of the short answer to how, does, how was Ontario able to embed media literacy standards in K-12 teaching, not very easily, mm -hmm. even though we, we have had a, a history of it. Um, because of course, it is um, subject to the, the whims of the governing um, provincial, so uh, for those of you who aren't necessarily familiar with um, Canadian perspective, uh, it's a very strong provincial education uh, thing. We have little pieces of federal, but it's mostly a provincial responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why uh, I'm going to talk a lot about the Ontario perspective rather than the Canadian perspective. Although we do have uh, Canadian media literacy standards that have been implemented throughout uh, different areas of Canada at different times. Um, so the current one we have right now for the media literacy standards um, was developed in 1998. Um, so it's slightly outdated. Mm -hmm. um, we, and, and then it, we had a, a refresh. Um, the Ontario standards for media literacy are embedded in part of the English or language arts curriculum. So we've got it from kindergarten um, to grade eight. And of course, we also have it in our secondary schools as well, 9 to 12. Um, and it has been because of a lot of advocacy and a lot of grassroots advocacy, um, thanks to the Association for Media Literacy, uh, which was uh, established um, 41 years ago, 1978, um, and had a lot of uh, various people involved in its, its foundation. So uh, Barry Duncan, who was a secondary school teacher. Um, I'm also, because I don't have this memorized, I can refer to, just in case you're interested in doing a little light reading, um, this part of the history of media literacy and media education in Canada uh, can be found in this article called Media Education in Canada, the Second Spring, um, by Neil Anderson, Barry Duncan, and John Pugenti. Okay. Um, so, it was a lot of advocacy, and by not just teachers. 
So it was, and that's why this bloom is fantastic, Lisa, because you've got, you've mm -hmm. got allies in mm -hmm. so many yeah. different quarters. Yeah. We need them in uh, academia. We need them in public broadcasting. We need them all over the place to be able to be the voices, oh, what, like mm -hmm. the Namley Dean here, mm -hmm. elevating voices, <laughs> to, to remind people from different areas that media literacy is important. Um, we still have a long way to go, so we, we had an update our, uh, to our curriculum expectations, um, but now they're, they're a little bit dated, about 10 years, um, and so we'd like to continue to see that. But of course, new governments, mm -hmm. um, uh, if those of you who are familiar, Doug Ford is the Premier of Ontario, uh, and he has some similarities with some other um, politicians south of the border. Um, however, <laughs> that, I think that was like a diplomatic way of saying it, right? Very was diplomatic. It? Okay, all right. But I know that we have a very media literate room, <laughs> so we can make the implicit messages clear um, with that. Um, so. We're very happy that we've got it in there, but it takes a grassroots organization, lobbying, um, being very uh, aware of the efforts that it takes because it can be easily lost. Can I, can I ask as well, was sure. there any pushback when, when media literacy is getting embedded in those standards from, from educators at all? And I'm, and I'm mm -hmm. thinking about the early educators in, in the yes. mix well, and, and, and how how did you kind and of so navigate much of it that? And so it's training too, Lisa, because when you have it in the expectations and you are, you have to teach this, there's a little bit of fear, especially mm -hmm. if you're not comfortable right. or right. familiar with the content. And so the, there could be a little bit of a backlash. There could be a little bit of, all right, well, is there a, a book that has some handouts or worksheets right. that I can create? Or, and that's where sometimes, despite having the expectations, the uh, production and the conversations and the discussions in the class might not be as elevated or as rich and deep and meaningful as you would hope it to be. It might be a, okay, we designed a cereal box. Or look at the book, look at the movie, compare them. And there's so much more right, right, to it. Right. Okay. Um, so yes, there, there yeah. is, but I think part of it is involving things like um, educating the educators, teaching the teachers, about how to do it. And I think your earlier panel um, did a great job in, in talking about how that's possible. And not just educators, but our public libraries and our public broadcasters and all these great people working together yeah. for media literacy yeah. education. So you've given me a good segue to Carrie. And that was completely Recognizing the libraries <laughs> in this. So, so Carrie, I wanted to bring you into the conversation because maybe not perhaps in, in today, in the room we have here today, and that's partly because I, um, I loaded the room up with librarians. But, but in other conversations and other forums where I've been and people have been talking about technology and education and what should this look like in the classroom or how, how should parents be um, in the mix, libraries haven't always been front and center mm -hmm. in the conversation. Mm -hmm. So tell us um, from, from your perspective why libraries need to be in the mix and maybe what they should be doing to make yeah. sure that they are and, and more elevated. And I'm kind of coming with, with two hats on my head. Right now I'm the Youth Service Coordinator for the state of Maryland and, and predominantly work with the public library systems in our state, but I was a school librarian for 10 years before, so I can totally picture what's happening in the schools and the whole educator picture as well as then how public libraries come alongside. And I just really as I've aged and gone through all these different phases of librarianship and working with children, I just feel so strongly that they are our kids in our communities. And what hours they're spending in a formal environment versus the informal environment of a public library is almost just becoming this seamless blend, I, I feel like, between where they are during certain hours of the day and then where they hopefully come into the, the after school hours or where we go out to them in the communities. And I just, I see what's happening in the schools with either one-to-one -one devices or the um, pressures of working in technology into the lesson plans and the teachers aren't always comfortable with that, that media mentorship role. They're focusing on the content that they need to teach through their, to get across through their standards and, and 
and whether it's open education resources in place of textbooks or however they need to get these standards across, they're really focusing on that content piece and just not all the nuances of the literacy and that, that digital competencies and digital literacies. And the parents aren't necessarily comfortable with it either, as we have talked a lot about this morning. So who's going to fill that role? Who's going to fill that niche? And it seems like that school librarian or that public librarian is the one that can come alongside and really provide that. And I feel like we're, we're evolving into this more and more. We're seeing it from the um, peer mentorship and the media men or the peer coaching and the media mentorship project in Maryland. And we're hearing it in other conversations from different conferences that the, the public library and the school librarians, it's a great way for us to work together to be that extra adult mentor to come alongside and just really provide the support. Um, and that can be like co-viewing and, and helping children. It's like when you, work, when you work with them with a book. Sometimes we give children a book to look at on their own. There was that question about, you know, when is it OK to like let them have this on their own? And, and then when do we come alongside and support them? And, and there's wonderful times to let children explore books and look at the pictures and think about what they're seeing. But there's also a lot of times where we, we sit with them and we read that with them together. We talk about what we're seeing and ask questions with the text. And that's exactly what we can do with media. Um, and find that time. And I feel like when in the library, we're so, so fortunate that we have the families with us a lot of times in the school. You know, you send things home, you may have your parent teacher conference, you may have those two or three times during the year when you, you see the families, but we see those families so much in the public library. So we have just this like golden opportunity to, to model and to mentor them as well as the children. So making the case um, seems actually fairly straightforward, making the case that libraries need to be kind of in the mix as we're thinking about our educational ecosystem and policies to support it. But then there's what Jamie said earlier on the panel, just like three words, like fund your librarian. Absolutely. And so are there, um, and, and then we'll go, we'll go down the, the panel here, but I just want to like kind of pinpoint, are there things right now that public libraries or school libraries don't have that they really need that, that are making this kind of a struggle to be able to get this? <laughs> The advocacy of our importance and our role. Um, I watch school librarians being removed for one reason or another. Um, all around. I mean, I've come from the Midwest. I've seen it there. I'm seeing it here. Um, Jamie, you summed it up. Just collaborate with a librarian, whether that's a school librarian or a public librarian. There is so much depth and um, enrichment that can happen to the learning that 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 really happens when you bring that those that co-teaching together um, that I can't I can't speak of enough so just sustained funding sustained advocacy to promote that and and again it, it's almost like I'm preaching to the choir in this room um, we need to be in principal conferences and we need to be with our 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 community leaders and just um, all the different people that can begin to understand the depth of what we do with our families. We're all about family engagement, whether that's in the schools or in the public libraries. And so we just need that understanding and the sustained funding. Absolutely. So Sarah, for public media, um, there are already so many resources. And, and Robin described the KQED teach um, in the materials that are up there. Um, so, so in some ways, public media has been been in the space um, already at a pretty visible, in a pretty visible way. But if you could just tell me a little bit about some of the media literacy education efforts in particular that public media is doing. And again, with the lens toward like what needs to change or what else might improve this for yeah, us. Yeah, and I, I think it's, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled to be representing all of my public media colleagues here in the room today. Um, and for those of you who don't understand how we work, we're sort of, as Robin sort of talked about, we're a co-op of stations, so to speak. So we have stations all over the country. We have 335 member stations. And um, because of the, that reach, we are both providing media in an, almost every household in America, but we're also providing resources on the ground education work, community engagement work um, that is reaching the vast majority of Americans who know about what we're doing. So some of it is just a lack of awareness of what public media does. Um, but specifically, we are also you know, hearing from our constituents, from educators, from folks all over the country that they're really struggling with how to integrate media in the classroom, 
Um, we also want to make sure, and we believe that public media has a unique role to play in making sure that every piece of media used in the classroom is high quality. And we're biased, of course, but we believe that public media provides high quality media that should be used in the classroom. We have free media on our um, website, pbslearningmedia.org, that is contextualized and cut up specifically for classroom use. Um, also for informal use in libraries, and I was really happy to hear Dorothy say that they were using public uh, PBS resources in the library. Um, so, you know, we are really focused on this question. We're hearing from the ground that educators are having a hard time with this. So we are working, so KQED, um, MPT, our Maryland, our Maryland station, they're working on different sort of efforts across the country to really focus on how do you help educators use this media better, uh, in, in better ways in the classroom. Um, we're also focused on a certification that, that Robin mentioned. Um, and really putting good media in the hands of educators, families, and connecting what kids are seeing at home to what they're learning in formal and informal spaces. So we're really excited about the opportunities to take the media we're creating, the PBS Kids resources in particular, and connecting them to um, learning experiences so that they spur a, a, or spark a learning experience. And back to your co-viewing um, point, um, we really think that's where our, you know, our media really shines, is mm -hmm. it provides opportunities for kids to watch something, for adults to interact with them and ask questions about the media they're viewing. We're not at all saying just put your kids in front of the media and just walk away, though that is, of course, a use case um, for us. You know, when you're cooking dinner, when you're taking a shower and your kids are home, we'd rather them be in front of PBS Kids resources than, than other things. Um, so. So on that note, though, we are also just, like I said, acutely aware that this is not an easy thing to do, mm -hmm. um, that using tech and media in the classroom isn't easy to do. And so we are working on professional development opportunities and this media literacy certification in partnership with KQED to really start to equip educators and informal educators like librarians with the tools they need to help um, students really access media appropriately, evaluate it, and even create their own media. So tell us a little bit more about this certification. So this is something, maybe a little bit just how, it, I'm a teacher, I want to get the certification, what do I do? But then also, I'm curious about whether you have buy-in from principals or those who are hiring. Um, or maybe it's even, you know, library directors and those who are hiring. Yeah. Do, it has the, has the word gotten out about this yet enough so that it's something they're looking for? Yeah, I mean, we're, I, I'm hoping this room can help us get the word out more widely. Um, so we launched this um, PBS Media Literacy Certification in partnership with KQED, um, and we recently launched a set of micro-credentials related to it. So I would say when we first started, we launched as a sort of a portfolio approach. We allowed teachers to, uh, to um, basically try to earn the certification through a submitting a portfolio of evidence. But we really, we've, we heard from participants, from teachers, from folks on the ground that that was a really hard thing to do. It mm -hmm. felt overwhelming. It felt like too big of a, an ask. And there wasn't always the recognition at home of that portfolio. So what we did, and, and KQED really led this effort. Um, John Sessler, who's sitting here, also wrote um, some micro-credentials around early learning. Um, but we partnered with Digital Promise to create a set of eight micro-credentials that really break that down. So to make it really bite-sized and easy for teachers to understand what are the specific competencies around analyzing media, around implementing media projects in early childhood, for instance, that were very specific and much more granular and sort of right-sized for teachers who were trying to figure out, how do I even start? Um, and so we, um, we launched the um, micro-credentials um, in March, and so um, we've had about 50 folks um, apply, uh, sort of submit evidence for micro-credentials, and we've had 25 earned so far, which is 50, that 50% 50 yield is, is fairly mm -hmm. typical mm -hmm. for the micro-credential right. yeah. um, sort of approach. But um, we think it's the right way to go, especially in early childhood, especially for informal educators who may not be getting the recognition from their schools and principals that they need, but 
this is a very specific and tangible thing that they can take and sort of own their own professional development. And it might be interesting to kind of compare that, I'll get back to you in a moment, to compare that to how, how in, in the Ontario kind of context, um, the evaluations and credentials work. Mm -hmm. But to, to jump over to, to Katia for a moment, um, I want to bring in um, both, uh, help people understand what IREX has been developing um, mm -hmm. in terms of its programs. And, and the name of the program that I first heard about is called Learn to Discern, which is like straight on point when we come to these questions of disinformation, misinformation. Um, but also, um, Katia, tell us about the research that you did um, behind those programs, because the research piece of this mm -hmm. will be key as well. Yes, of course. And thank you for having me on this panel. This has been a great morning for me and very motivating to see educators, librarians engage in this and really wanting to talk about this and having the resources. Because for us, um, so IREX works globally. I'll just give you a very quick introduction of what IREX does and who we are. Um, we're an international organization and we work in, um, right now we work in about 120 countries. A lot of those are networks, but we have offices in 25 countries. And traditionally, we've been doing a lot of academic exchanges and sort of cultural understanding programming, as well as media development, civil society strengthening, governance, youth development, conflict resolution. That was our portfolio. And then in 2014, we found ourselves in Ukraine with a need to do something else. Um, and I was, I was in Ukraine at the time. Ukraine was sort of hit with this wave of disinformation. I was really having really visible, acute outcomes on how people make decisions about separating, splitting. It was, it was not just the community divisions where people talk about it and disagree, not just the polarization of views, it was actual splitting of the country. And so we've, um, traditionally because we worked so much with media, uh, we thought, well, maybe we could counter. And then very quickly, probably within the first half an hour of thinking about it, we said, no, we can't. You can't counter disinformation, especially coming from a machine like Kremlin. So we found ourselves at a place leaning onto our education and youth development approaches and think, and library work. Actually, mm -hmm. Ukraine at that time has been wrapping up a seven-year massive program that has turned Ukrainian library systems, public library system, into a um, community hub function. We were actually trying the Ukrainian library sector show their relevance and how they shouldn't be an institution which is just perceived as a book lending sort of um, place where you just, you just go and shush and no one talks and <laughs> trying to change them into the safe community spaces where people engage with information generally. And so those were the three things that we've leaned on and we realized we need to develop a new approach. We actually need to equip those who interact with information because we don't have time to, for systems change in terms of um, countering or working with platforms or how this is going to be the spread of information, the dissemination channels. channels. Um, and we came up with a program called, called Learn to Discern, but it wasn't an easy, very quick process. And as Lisa mentioned, a lot of research went both into the development of the program and into proving to stakeholders that it works and it needs to be taken to a system approach, to the education system in our case. Um, so the research we've done is, first of all, it was desk research looking on what's out there. And we looked at media literacy, of course, and there were some resources, but we realized that nothing that has existed in that context what we could use at the time actually matched the evolution of the informational ecosystem that has occurred in the last 10 years. Even without disinformation in Ukraine, we would be in deep trouble if we just tried to use what's out there in terms of media literacy, because it was very media and very literacy focused. And what we need to do now is neither of those two narrow things. It's information generally. We have long ago shifted from, unfortunately, professional, very good, objective reporters creating information mm -hmm. to where anyone, is a, anyone can be a producer of information and it is incredibly easy to share information. And I have heard journalists especially claim, well, this is not a new problem. This has happened when the press print was invented or when, you know, just sort of mass literacy programs um, have sort of educated populations and now anyone can write, but never before was it so easy and so far reaching yeah. as it is now. Yeah. And so that was one thing to take into account. And the other thing that was important to take into account, which we, we had to do a lot of research and learning internally, is understanding how what has happened with this informational landscape has affected us as humans. 
and how these things, propaganda, misinformation, disinformation, the noise generally is so effective and has such negative consequences um, because it leverages something very intrinsically human in us. The cognitive shortcuts that has helped us along the way, they helped us belong and figure out how there's concepts of confirmation bias everyone has heard. There's also selective reasoning and conformist reasoning where you'd rather be in a group and belonging in a group be right than, than be right sometimes. And those things are so, um, make us so vulnerable when we talk about the digital transformation of how information is shared and spread right now that um, we, we're just sort of caught off guard when that happens. And so the approach that we've developed kind of tried to reflect those, um, those new points and we've built in elements of understanding your emotional and cognitive processes when you interact with information and how do you quickly sort of catch yourself or identify um, manipulative markers of if, if you get immediately angry when you read an article and you have that compulsion to share or compulsion to go out and talk mm -hmm. to your neighbors and be all outraged um, sort of name that reaction understand that when you are angry you're not going to make the right decision no matter what yeah. is it yeah. And so that was kind of the one side of the research we've done. The so other, oh, sorry. Yes, yeah, so well, I was just going to say, yeah. if you could also, just as you're describing, yeah. that's the, the, the research to kind of set up the program. Yeah. But then you also um, looked at whether it worked. Yeah. And so I just want to make sure we get to that. Yes, yes, sorry. And I, I yes. could talk about this all day, so I'm, yes. I apologize. Um, and so then, we, because we have, uh, and actually the first donor who's funded our work was the Canadian government uh -huh -huh. to do this work. So it was... Um, <laughs> It was very much appreciated, but because we are, we received funding from the donor, it was a lot of pressure both internally and externally to show the results. Um, and also, we really wanted to take those results to the education system because we wanted mm -hmm. to build a case for why this is really necessary. So we looked at what worked and what didn't, and we've um, invested into a an impact study of actually looking at behavior change. At, at the changes in awareness, knowledge, skills, but also habits of how people interact with, inter with information as a result of our study. Um, and we have conducted, um, a, a, it was a longitudinal study too, because we went back a year and a half after we worked with Ukrainians on this program, tracked down 200 participants and conducted a stratified randomized control trial with those who haven't been through the program to see other differences in demand for good information, in recognition of the manipulative information, in, in what they do, what, the, what practices they engage in, um, whether we train them or not. And we found that Ukrainians who've been through our programs, uh, and this was, this was um, we've done two studies, so I'm talking about the adult population where we wanted to get to everyone who's making decisions at the moment. They were 23% um, better at something called lateral reading, which is basically cross-checking information and not trusting the one original source that sold them something. Um, they were 27% better at identifying and rejecting hate speech and understanding why that's not okay. Mm -hmm. um, they were better at telling opinion from fact, which turned out to be one of those basic skills that you think you have, but yep. frankly not, especially when there's a lot of data manipulation um, in, in, in reporting the, you know, the malign actor reporting. Um, and so, and those were statistically significant sustained gains a year and a half after people had been originally trained. We also conducted a lot of qualitative analysis and have done interviews and sort of looking at why it worked and we found that the key aspects of why what we do works is that uh, it's interesting it all goes back again to this emotion and, and the processes the cognitive and emotional processes but basically this gradual accumulation of we are aware that this is a problem and we understand that we need knowledge leads to better buy-in and then in ukraine we used uh, libraries as places to train people because they are perceived as safe and neutral. They're not politically affiliated. They, are, they have this mm -hmm. reputation of really being a place where you come for information. And so that trust that people had, because the, the people lo lost trust in a lot of institutions in Ukraine when that happened, libraries remained a trusted resource. Yeah. And sort of having that trusted conveyor of skills and knowledge actually really helped in the retention of knowledge. So, so what, what Katya has described, um, I, it, to me, the, being able to really start collecting data mm -hmm. and evidence about what we're even talking about here today and being able to kind of query it as well and then bring it forward could be one of these kind of future directions for the field, I think, as well. So, and I, I'm um, sorry to, to cut you off there, but as I, 
there's so much richness in what you're describing. So I did want people to know, though, that um, there are in the, in the digital resources folder that we sent to, uh, most of you have this, but we'll make sure that if you didn't get it, um, you get the link. Um, it's an open folder that has all sorts of materials we've been talking about today. Within it are materials that Katia has provided and some presentations she's given that show a little bit more of the data. There's also um, a couple of, of articles in there. I wrote for Slate uh, magazine last year about these results when they first came out, and you can see how this program is set up. So let me turn now just to get um, some, a couple of other ideas from, from all of you, and then we're going to turn it open to some, some questions from the floor. Um, and and, uh, and be somehow in your answer, Diana, it may not be possible, but I do think it would be interesting to people in the room to hear how in Toronto teachers are evaluated, or how the standards kind of affect the way they're, they're approached. But just kind of ponder on that for a moment. Um, but one of the things I wanted to try to get out into the conversation was a sense of like where to prioritize when it comes to policy and, and research. Um, so if each of you could maybe tell me, what is, what is say one thing, if you can come up with one policy that would make a really big difference, um, and especially for children who don't have as much access to some of the resources we're talking about here today. Um, and if you can't just come up with one, maybe it's one and a couple others. But um, maybe I'll send over to maybe Carrie first, and then we'll come back to Diana. And um, are there some priorities that you think we should be putting yeah, on the table? This is a tricky one, and I did bring in my colleagues who were talking about you know what, that one policy, and it and it's hard to really, from a public library standpoint, really pin that down. Um, I think it does fall back to those two big buckets about education and the funding. And I think from an education standpoint, we created this toolkit that came out of the um, Media Mentorship Project in Maryland. And it's something that's available. It's online. It's something that any staff, any even a, a group of educators could do, um, public librarians could do to help build those skills and that confidence and looking at us as media mentors and embracing, because the data is an interesting piece. And when we were collecting the data from the project in Harford County, there was a definite um, kind of uh, variance in how the public librarians were picturing themselves as being media mentors. And some had much more confidence in that than others. Some realized they were more of a media mentor than they realized when they kind of dug down into what that really represented in terms of what they already do um, in supporting families and providing that reader's advisory, which translates into support with media. But it's still, um, I think, really important for us to have something that either our associations embrace or we have that kind of a, a, a toolkit or curriculum that can be done either by current uh, practitioners as public librarians or school librarians or happens in the pre-service. Um, time when, when librarians are going through um, library school mm -hmm. or, you know, like the early, early education educators are also going through their curriculum to get that mindset and to be able to see that this is something that we um, will be a part of my, my role as a children's librarian. I think that's really, really important. So it's, it's kind of embracing the current staff, pre-service, and then just that critical piece to have the funding to have these projects like we had in Maryland. Yeah. Professional Learning at the Center. So how about you, Diana? Oh, I know. What do you so, think? Like you, Carrie, I talked with other people because <laughs> how do you yeah, decide Yeah, I, I prepped them ahead policy. of time. I said, I need one. you to tell me one policy. One policy. So I talked with my colleagues uh, who are part of the Association of Media Literacy in Ontario. And when we sort of group brainstormed, our, our sort of answer was to embed media literacy across the curriculum. Mm -hmm. So right now in Ontario, it is in the the area of language arts. And I was so happy to hear Peggy talk about science and media literacy. Because even though, and, and I should mention, I'm a teacher librarian and a media literacy teacher at a kindergarten, pre-kindergarten. Sorry, I have to use the, I have to translate to American. To American. <laughs> so there's a pre-K to grade eight school um, in Toronto. Um, so. Even though, so even though, yes, media literacy and being able to help is an important part of school libraries and public libraries, but it can't be ours and ours alone. 
we, and I'm seeing a lot of nods in the audience, because it needs to be the science teacher who realizes that we need to do media literacy, the social studies teacher, the history and geography teacher that needs to realize that it's all media. And you need to help our students. Uh, you don't teach, you teach through and about media. And so that's why making it, and yeah, we have a very interesting relationship with the government and stuff like that. But if the government could sort of mandate that it's part of all curriculum, not just the language arts one, I think it would, it would go far. And mm -hmm. Carrie, it's funny what you've said because you hit about four <laughs> of the eight conclusions that we had in the article I mentioned earlier about recommendations for successful development of media education. Okay. That was wild. Yeah. Okay. It's just, it's continuous yeah. learning. Yeah. And let's go we'll get, if we can, maybe get that into the digital resource folder for mm. others to read yes. as well. Yes. So, yes. So, um, so Sarah, what's, what's your one policy? Well, I, I would say, of course, as PBS, I can't advocate for any policies. However, <laughs> Um, I, my mind immediately went to assessment, and it went back to your question, Lisa. It's recognition of different types of professional development opportunities for educators, so that there would be recognition and um, credit for things like micro-credentials, I think is a big one. And then I was also thinking about assessment on the student side of things, because if we were more open to, and more schools and districts were open to portfolio types of assessment, it would allow for more student media creation itself, which would then, you know, sort of push teachers and educators and informal educators to be more open to that sort of learning and, you know, demonstration of skills and competencies. Yeah, so I, so I really, I went sort of in the assessment direction. And Katya? So I have to go with, I agree on the integration into the instruction in all subjects. That's what we ended up doing in Ukraine after doing all the data analysis and all the impact assessments. We made a case to the Ministry of Education in Ukraine that they should follow the model that Finland does, where they integrate media literacy throughout from early childhood through university education into all subjects. And so in Ukraine, we've picked, um, for the pilot, we've picked five. We, we show Ukrainian teachers how you can integrate it into Ukrainian language, literature, history, world history, and arts and humanities, and you can really build specific skills into how you teach the subjects. We actually found that students reported that they loved the lessons that had those integrated skills better and learned more, not just about media literacy, but about the subject as well, because we pushed teachers to use technology. Um, but I think that's the way to go. It has to go hand in hand with teacher training, of course, both pre-service and in-service for it to have an effect. Um, but that's the most systems change uh, kind of policy that we found, at least in the, in the context of Ukraine. Can I just make a plug? Yes, yes, for please. And then we'll get your questions ready. I'm going to take a couple if, of them really, really quick. And then we'll if because we not only look at the school systems and because we understand that change through the school system is taking a long time, but sometimes you need something immediate, we also want to lobby for partnerships with Media, media institutions for a public awareness campaign. I think there is a need in, in this country and many other countries just of general public awareness about how this is a problem. And actually, you need to address it and you need to be as discerning about what you consume online and offline as you are when you consume food. Yes. So what, what we'll do is we'll take two, maybe one or two questions and we'll take them together and then have who if one wants to respond to that and then, and then we'll break for lunch unless there maybe isn't, isn't a burning question out there um, that someone has. Anybody want to ask something? Yes, Sherry, if someone could bring a microphone and make sure to say your name and, and of course, your organization. Hi, Sherry Hochfolger. Uh, I'm with the Center for Media and Information Literacy at Temple University and longtime board member, although not right now, <laughs> at Namely. So uh, the assessment question to me is a pivotal one because in the United States, teachers are um, teaching to the test often. So we could have a whole discussion about that, but putting that aside, does anybody have experience in a set student assessment around media literacy that is successful? Uh -huh. That's a great question. Okay, well, let's go with that and then we'll, we'll close out if anybody. Yes, Katia, do you want to jump in? So because, because we've, um, again, the work we've done in Ukraine has required us to demonstrate the results that what we've done with integrating the skill building into curricula works, both to the ministry and to our donors, which was the UK and the US government. Um, we have conducted, we have developed and um, administered a test to students 
on how they have, what skills they have retained from those lessons, how they apply them, and whether there was, so it was a, basically a skill test which was done um, through a, uh, basically you are exposed to questions and you have to analyze a text, to interact with a post, a YouTube video, and then demonstrate how you would engage with it. Um, and also t attitude and, and um, an attitude and behavior change, which was a self-report. So it was a two-part test that we've done. It was quite intense. Um, it was randomized control, again, because we have uh, a pilot subset of schools and then we um, selected sim similar demographically and geographically schools and we matched the results and we found that actually after an average of eight to 10 lessons, which integrated the skills, kids who have taken them were d demonstrated really amazing results. For example, they were 18% more likely to, uh, to recognize hate speech. Um, there was a 16% gain in being able to tell opinion from fact. And when I say these 16, 18%, sometimes we get pushback on like, oh, well, that's really low. And what I want to say is everything, as educators, you also probably know change in education is cumulative after the idea is that this is integrated throughout. And also we're not starting from zero. This is closing the gap that the kids have. Right. So these are actually really important results. Um, and we do have the methodology um, in the resources that Lisa shared, oh, there's a, okay. a methodology on how we have done this. And I have colleagues at Manly tomorrow doing a research um, pageant, or I forgot what it's called. It's a like poster a poster session? The, yeah, and they're going to talk about how we've done those specific assessments. Okay. I am actually going to close this down. I'm so sorry that we didn't have much more time. This is such a, um, there's so much to get into here. Everybody, thank you, uh, join me in thanking our amazing panelists. <laughs> So I want to make sure. Um, so what, what we'll do now is we'll have a 15 minute break and there's, there's some lunch in the back. Um, and I'm not, I think that's where most of it is. Someone can tell me if I'm wrong or possibly outside. Um, and we'll come back together again at 12.15. You do not want to miss 12.15. So you can eat your lunch and watch the amazing Molly of Denali uh, clips we're going to show you. Thank you.